Hello everyone, and good evening. Thank you again for joining us yet again for another session of The Pitman Sculpture. We are now on session three of this wonderful Apocalypse Keys miniseries here on Speculate, uh, joined with our lovely friends from que Queen's Court Games, who I'm very excited to play uh, and get into more shenanigans with in just a little bit. Uh, we have been uh, through a great deal so far, and I'm very excited for us to hopefully clean up the mess that we have made. Um, but before that, uh, obviously, uh, a bit of housekeep housekeeping notes. Uh, a reminder to everyone that you can support Speculate on all the lovely content that we make uh, by checking out the website at speculatesf.com or joining us at patreon.com slash speculate. Uh, we are very slowly uh, uh, aiming to grow and gain more uh, resources so we can make even more cool things like this for you at the uh, level of quality necessary for it to be uh, as entertaining and valuable to you as possible. So if you can support us, and of course also support Queen's Court Games, who also makes a great deal of lovely stuff as well, uh, you would be doing all of the wonderful AP that we make and strive to make in the uh, upcoming year a great favor. So please, definitely uh, do that. But uh, as we prepare to dive back into the mystery of the Pitman Sculpture, I would like to let I would like to ask all of these lovely people to please let everyone know who you are, what you do, and who you will be playing this evening. Starting with Mike. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike. Uh, I use they or he pronouns. I'm one of the co-hosts of Speculate, along with Brandon and Greg. I am an author, game designer, and actual play person here. Um, I, my latest book is actually Candela Obscura, which is a tabletop role-playing game by uh, Darrington Press that I contributed to and did some consulting on. It is a investigative horror game, and you can find out more about it at Darrington Press slash Candela. Um, I am playing Tempo, the last, who is a kind of fish-out-of-water superhero who has been, quote-unquote, saddled with the, uh, the, the loser team of monsters who in fact are awesome and wonderful and all deserving of love. And that's me. Uh, next, Yoi. Hello. Uh, welcome to this evening, because I presume it is an evening in which you are hearing this. I am Yoi Gawain Lin. I am a game and fiction writer. My pronouns are he, they. And tonight, essentially, I am playing Hamalio. And apocalyptic cinnamon roll i guess is the best way of putting it this indeed is a very succinct way of putting it uh next aaron hi hello i am aaron i uh, like to call myself a writer but i found out recently that in order to do that you actually have to write so let me get back to you on what it is i do uh, I'm the Forever GM over at Queen's Court Games, horror storyteller, and general actual play uh, thinker pedant. That's me. I am playing John slash Jane, the blank-faced empath who is a, uh, a sum total average of every human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll gently push back on that writer note. If the only way to become a writer is to actually write, I think only one of the five of us is a writer, and it's not even me either. Um, so that's also, uh, I reject that idea on its face, but still. <laughs> I did not mean to call people out. <laughs> How dare. And last but not least, Aubrey. Hello, I'm Aubrey. I use she or her pronouns. Uh, I usually find me over at Queen's Court doing all the technical directy things and playing and running games. Uh, and I'm also the co-producer and uh, the GM over at Goblets and Gaze. And tonight I play uh, Ciara, your local pyromaniac with a nice, neat new sword collection, who also uses she, her pronouns. Mm -hmm. I forgot you had a cursed sword. Yeah, That's sword cute. things happened. We're going to get to that very quickly at some point. Um, but as for me, uh, I'm Brandon O'Brien, uh, and I keep the keys so you don't have to. I am one of the co-hosts of Speculate and a writer, poet, and game designer from Trinidad and Tobago. And I am here with the sole purpose of ensuring that the shenanigans become more catastrophic for all of these lovely monsters. Um, so we should get right into that. Um, 
as uh, our uh, lovely representatives of the post office, the lowliest branch of division, uh, have gotten closer to the Pitman sculpture, they eventually discover the two nerds who just bought it on the internet on a lark, who are surprised and frightened that they're being followed, at which point they reveal that they've been being followed the entire time and not by this group. At which point, all hell breaks loose at the hotel where everyone is staying, um, where several members of the Beatographs come to claim the Pitman sculpture in a very messy fashion um, and have laid waste to most of the police officers who are present in an attempt to escape. Ciara blew a hole through the hotel wall. Um, there is, like piles of gold and jewelry and broken trees everywhere that the Beatographs made in order to escape you. And now, having survived the ordeal, um, uh, the post office now, the post office representatives now have the Pitman sculpture in a glass case and also are surrounded by dead or injured police officers and a broken building that they now have to answer for. Um, and we're immediately going to get into that by first uh, checking in with Tempo. Tempo, you have a, an opening move for the session, yes? Yes. So I have the move A Flickering Hope. At the start of each session, describe a memory you have of your people. Choose to speak with love, sorrow, or both. Say what you hope for, spend darkness tokens, and roll. So I'm going to build on the memory from the end of last session where the kind of consuming psionic horde um, threatened the Relayum, and the Relayum created weapons such as the Blade of Psionic Annihilation. Um, we're going to jump back to the time when Tempo had to last use a Blade of Psionic Annihilation as the kind of non-military leader of a what was effectively a militia group that formed in the vacuum of like broader top-down organization uh, because the consuming horde um, known as the noise came over the relay very like suddenly and Tempo being kind of an exemplar among their people reached forward in time for a weapon to get the Blade of Psionic Annihilation at that point, which was then used to reverse engineer a pattern so that others could make it. And we see now that the blade that they reach for has a same identifying mark that Tempo has just grabbed from the past. There is a, a like... A, f a small fracture or a fuller down the blade and we see tempo basically cutting through hordes of um, like silvery yellow metallic um, too many limbed uh, insects with wings that go in directions that they shouldn't and a psionic hum that can be described as nothing more than just a pervasive headache and this memory for for Tempo is all sorrow, even though they are fighting on behalf of their people, because they're having to deal death en masse. And they, they, they're going to this because they hope that they will never have to kill on that scale again for any reason. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... And I'm going to spend two tokens and roll. That is a perfect hit. So okay. on an 8 to 10, your memory grants you an epiphany. Choose two. Describe how a fellow monster reminds you of someone from your past. Gain one bond with them. Describe how the tragedy of your people haunts you. Gain one bond with what the darkness demands. Describe the long overture of the apocalypse and how it claimed your people. Uncover a key. So because I get two, I'm going to take a bond with what the darkness demands because we see in this moment and tempo realizes in this moment looking down at the blade that they may have in fact created a paradox 
I was about I was about to ask if that was a possibility that happened because that's the same sword that you have right now, right? Which so, means that this sword has never been made before. That sure seems possible, doesn't it, Brandon? Who knows? Maybe we'll find out. I, yes, I am very excited to find out. Um, so the other other choice I'm going to do is describe the long overture of the apocalypse and how it claimed your people. We get then a f um, flashing montage of more and more threats, internal and external, where the Relayim are drawing more deeply on their void magic and their temporal manipulation. And it's just, here's an excuse to go a little bit further. It's desperate enough, we have to go a little bit further. And t actions like the ones that Tempo has now taken, like bookends, are that overture. But that gives us a key. So I would ask you, Brandon, what, what key might kind of occur to Tempo or emerge from this bookending? <laughs> so I love manifesting keys for Tempo as you are attempting to witness one thing in time and then time interrupts you. So we're going to do that again. Um, so you are... You have now come back out in the, into the front of the hotel and witnessed all of this carnage. And this memory washes upon you almost as a mirror image or a bookend of the carnage that is a, laid out in front of you on this street. Because there was a point during the noise war where uh, the violence was so widespread and so many uh, civilians were called to arms um, in order to defend against the noise that for large portions of the tail end of the war, entire uh, theaters of war would go unclared for months, that you would engage in a battle on a city street somewhere and those bodies would remain there because no one was, everybody else was fighting or hiding. And you are looking right now in this memory at a street in one of the more otherwise more bustling city centers before the noise at before the noise attacked. Um, dozens of noise and relay on both. Um, lying in the street, severely injured, already gone. The street is quiet except for this weird buzzing. And you settle on this memory for a bit, trying to recall what point of the war is this? And then you focus a little bit and you realize all of the Relayam that are injured or dead here have not been harmed by noise. You, having fought in the war, you know the telltale, like, psionic overwhelm or otherwise physical biting or scratching that they would have uh, suffered at the hands of the noise. Everybody here is, like, frozen. They have these, like shocked looks on their faces that seem petrified into their bodies. They're all stiffly laid on the ground. And that's when you rem remember that there was a point later on in the war where in that tension of constantly pushing against time for more resources to fight against the war, uh, one of your superiors discovered a kind of meta-temporal weapon that had the capacity to freeze an object in its own state in time, such that it would still experience the passage of time while petrified within their own, um, with, within their own body, essentially freezing an entity in time. And at first it was just like, 
let's make arrows that did these things or small bolt guns that did these things so we could aim specifically at the noise and prevent any casual any um civilian casualties because we have no idea how to undo this this is kind of a dangerous weapon to just have waving around in the world and then it escalated to no we are being overwhelmed by the noise far too heavily let's just make a cannon and shoot it up streets on a regular basis Everyone here on this street is frozen. You know who is responsible. You know that you will probably never get any of these people back. Their last moments were in terror, either of being eaten alive by the noise or never having another moment again. Just frozen in the one in the one affair that they have right now. And as you are looking, your gaze kind of recenters itself into this Los Angeles street. And then it centers itself somewhere else that you know is here, roughly here being the United States, and now, roughly now being sometime in the recent future. Where you see what looks like what looks like shadows emerging from um light being cast upon nearby walls or nearby uh light poles um in very early morning somewhere in the United States, but instead of being dark umbral shapes, they present as very bright iridescent shapes emerging from beneath those objects. And every time they touch something that is not where that otherwise shadow would have come from, they start changing those things. The wall of a jewelry store starts turning into teddy bears. Um, a nearby baby stroller starts leaking melted gold and starts deforming until um, it's no longer there. And the mother starts grabbing their baby up out of what is now liquid metal and running away. It just keeps touching things and turning them into weirdly ornate things all of a sudden and you get this impression that that's not going to stop that it's a thing that once it starts happening there is no physical force that can undo it it needs to stop on its own and you watch it in this manner of seconds in this vision but for you passing out over days you see these shadows start consuming everything that it can touch until only a few shadow casting objects remain because nothing remains to touch them and streets are as desolate then as they are now but in the place of petrified relayum you see bankers and teachers who have turned into golden statues or piles of jewelry or weird expressionist paintings where you know someone or someone's car or someone's house or some or all the things that make up the weird collections of our lives have now been reduced to all of these otherwise beautiful in scare quotes things and it immediately strikes you as like a solid thought in your brain The Beatographs care so much about beauty, they are willing to destroy the world in order to have more of it. Beauty for beauty's sake, and not, for, not even for their own. 
Okay. So to be specific, the the key is the iridescence or beauty for beauty's sake or both? I'll give you both. Okay. Um, and do we know the complexity of this mystery, which is part of kind of the mechanics in unlocking death, um, Doom's door? Did I tell you that already? I have that in a note somewhere. Yeah, we can come back to it, but probably not. Don't want to wait too long since we've got nine yes. keys now. Mm-hmm. But yes, those are the key, those are the keys that you have now discovered. Okay. Cool. Um, as you return to the present moment, what are your thoughts now about the scene that you are still witnessing in front of you? So the the presumed beatograph person has disappeared, projected off by a massive golden tree trunk that the goldenness of it reminds me of the kind of um, dangerously excessive gold in the vision of the iridescence. And when like we get a kind of POV shot as if from Tempo's sight and on the street that is like somewhat ravaged by chaos, there is an, uh, like a double image overlay of the Relayum street for, for just a moment until kind of Tempo uh, blinks and then the audio that's actually the tempo is actually hearing kind of turns up and replaces the memory of the the desolate street and they turn to the the sound which may be a civilian maybe something else okay you Reemerge in this space. Um, one of the junior police officers. This guy looks fairly young, overwhelmingly traumatized. This like buff, but obviously very scared. Twenty, twenty-one year old comes up to you first and goes, "Can anyone just explain to me just what happened? We were here looking for those two pointing at Collins and his and his companion. Um, and then things happened. Do, I don't know what to call those other guys. Are they, was that an act of terrorism? Was I, 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 you're probably the only person who's capable of like describing this kind of superhero level weirdness. So I guess if there's anything you can tell us, speaking directly to Tempo, and only Tempo. It is, in fact, an artifact, a happening of extraordinary circumstances which I wish to protect you and your communities from. If you are fearful, if you fear for what is to come, know that I and my team will do everything we can to protect you. But now we must go. Go. Why? 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 Why are we going? Where are we going? Apologies. Grammar in your language is imprecise. My we is my team. You may remain here and see to the safety of your community. We, uh, um, um, uh, um, mm, hmm. It, this guy's freaking out. Um, okay. What was the first time you decided that you wanted to become a protector? I, um, God, I lost my 
little sister and a drunk driving thing. I was still in college when it happened. I wasn't even in the state. Um, and I just wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that that stopped happening. I just wanted to be the kind of guy that saw people make mistakes and helped them realize they didn't have to make mistakes anymore. I didn't even want to be the guy with the gun. He literally lifts a hand, he literally lifts his sidearm out of his pocket and throws it into the pile of rubies that was his immediate superior. I have not been on this world especially long. But if this form of protector does not suit you, there are others and you may yet protect so that others do not suffer the loss that you have suffered. I am sorry for that loss and I share in your grief. Grief shared is grief reduced and we shall carry it with us so that we may use it to protect others. Now I must go. Okay, um, he takes out his police business card and hands it to you. If there's anything you need to let us know so we can respond to this, I guess. And then he looks around a bit, like he's confused as to what his next plan of action should be. There is nothing in the guidebook for how to respond to this. And... Immediately just kind of walks off into a, a random direction where some of his other um, injured or dead uh, colleagues are. As you are headed towards the group, uh, Sierra. Yeah. You also have a beginning of session move. I do not nearly as involved as Tempo's is. Um, mine is called My Hands Around Your Heart. Uh, and at the start of each session, I choose another PC to be your heart and share the burden of your power with. And say why they hope, uh, why you hope they will save you from what darkness demands. Um, and for this session, I will choose Tempo um, and sort of the idea of they inspire me to be better, uh, to push past the darkness. Okay. Uh, you are still in the front of the hotel, right? Yes, I am. Cool. Um, Temple, who are you approaching first out of the rest of your team? Um, is Hamaliel still wreaking, wreaking havoc on the other side of the building or did that end? Oh, that ended. No. That was also in front. Okay. That was before the, the Beatographs fled. Yes, I am in the front of the hotel with Ciara, and I like to imagine that Hamaliel is quite um, socially foolishly like playing with the rubies that the lead cop used to be. Um, they're just kind of mixing it around and poking it because they are fascinated. Um, they are the law of dissolution, and this guy literally dissoluted into rubies. That's not something organic life does. Huh. The laws sure changed once they died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're just basically mucking around in this and, like, clearly taking up a handful to put in their pocket for later to study or mess with. Yeah, I think Tempo looks for um, Jane at first because uh, he's the one who is, is supposed to have the sculpture. Yeah, and you can tell because um, Jane is wearing the same hoodie that they have worn literally every time you've met them. And uh, the hands are still in the pocket, but there is a very suspicious statue-shaped bulge like right in the chest region. Um, while they're using the gloves to, you know, go, I don't know how you clean up this kind of place. I suppose if left to their own devices, it'll be a moment where, like, one glove off screen is just reaching over to Hamaliel and being like, yeah, maybe not. And just like a, like a slow tap on the hands. But aside from that, yeah. 
doing the thing where I've got one of these swords sort of like up over my shoulder, you know, just sort of like, yeah, we did good. Mm -hmm. Which I will qualify another thing because I didn't get to qualify it before, but for the purposes of making them as cool as possible, I'm going to qualify now. This sword is as the this sword is as big as a gun blade. Yes. So in um, whatever reaction uh, John is having to any of this is not on their face, both literally, but also just you, no sense of, of remorse or sadness, but also like joy, just just flatlined. So uh, as tempo as you're approaching, uh, the one hand that is not currently occupied, uh, pointing at the chest, like looking for this. If the item is secure, we should fall back to a secure location and sh share information. Amalia loses the pantomime fight with Jane's gloved hand. First, she tried to put the rubies into the glove, like put into the wrist hole of the glove, and then tried to put it in the palm of the glove. And then when the hand smacked their hand, they're like, oh, okay, puts the rubies back on the ground. So then as the conversation is finishing with tempo, it does like, come on. <laughs> bottle, bottle, bottle. Uh, Colin's, uh, Colin's colleague hears you all have this conversation and immediately calls out to you all. So what about us? What about all the money we spent? What about everything that just happened to us? You're just gonna leave us high and dry after we almost died? That is a natural step. You will be fine. I mean, hey, look at this way. You don't have the thing that they're searching for anymore. We gave him the card, right? The form. Yeah, there's like a uh, yeah, a, a, a basically yeah, like the lost... insurance claim form. <laughs> <laughs> the division insurance claim form. Mm -hmm. Has your life and or property been damaged by an agent? Sign this form. <laughs> the accounts distributable department is very prompt and thorough. I mean. I, I have no idea what that means. And then Collins turns to him and goes, do you have any idea what the last hour has meant? And then they both just kind of shrug at each other. I As that, that happens, um, Ciara, I would like you to qualify a thing for me. Okay. Is any and is any part of the fire that you previously set set still ablaze anywhere on the property nearby? Probably some on the building itself, maybe some on the ground because I did scorch several people into swords. So I imagine there's like probably like a couple of rings of fire where people used to be that are just kind of burning because it's that hot. Mm -hmm. Um, as that previous conversation is happening you see a large angry man in a suit walk out of the flames where the other where the swords were made because there are still like two swords there it's just hanging around just walks out of the fire Ciara you're the first person to notice mm -hmm. Ayer is here Uh oh. That's unfortunate. Someone's uh, about to live up to their namesake. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Look at everyone else just being like, well, I think our job is done here. We should definitely get out of here. I agree with whatever else we said. We can discuss we can discuss this and figure this out in a, in a safe place. I tug on like the glove hand that went like this to be able to So see feel that see Jane or see Ciara's face next to tempo so then just kind of like 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 very I don't can you snap gloves that are empty with psionic powers I mean okay my rules yes snaps and then it's kind of like really subtly as a subtly as a floating glove can points like past Ciara's shoulder to Iyer uh -huh. we know who's in charge of talking to him and it's none of us <laughs> <laughs> um Ciara and John you see 
Ayo, walk out of the flame, step to the side, draw a rectangle in the like large billowing flame behind him in the shape of a door mm-hmm. and the gesture the fire forward as if genuinely opening a door and then he points at Sierra and gestures towards the the open door frame just her all of you uh Hamaliel picks up the limo door from the ground and moves in front holding it like uh, a siege breaking shield <laughs> you walk past Aya Aya puts his pinky finger on the limo door and the entire limo door melts Oh. you're going to have to pay for that get inside but that was our emotional support limo door. <laughs> we gotta get another one. Oh. I'm n- not gonna say no. I'm obviously going to follow. Yeah. But... <laughs> As you all step through the door, you are now back in the post office. Uh, the flame closes behind you. And you realize that it is essentially the front door of the post office that has now regained its normal shape and uh, materials. And the very first thing that Aya says, before he even like turns around to face you all again, he goes, Why do you only have 80% of the Pitman sculpture? Right. Jane is blinking. Uh, and we'll unzip the hoodie, which uh, I don't know that actually anyone has ever seen Jane not wearing the hoodie, but underneath is like a, it's a black A-frame tank top, and then underneath that, a binder. Uh, hmm. And is looking down and like pulls out the statue, I having no idea what 80% or 100% looks like, but is like, eh? When you look at the glass case again, it is just the pewter outline of the fabric that would have rested upon um, the rest of the bola hat topped figure of the veiled gentleman floating in the air inside the glass case by itself. The outline of the rest of the statue is no longer there. That seems significantly less than 80%. Uh, I was like this when I found it. No, it was no, not. It wasn't that. like that. It wasn't like that when we found it. It looked very different. I'd like to ask what happened, but I have eyes, so I saw. I gave instructions. The tips of Ayer's flame-topped head are turning blue. Can anyone remind me of the instructions that I gave Ciara? Can you remind me of the instructions that I gave? Uh, something about uh, not causing too much damage. Cool. What do you think is too much damage, Ciara? The building is mostly still standing. Mostly. You know what's more ideal than mostly still standing? Jane, can you tell me what's more ideal than mostly still standing? Uh, no, no, given the circumstances, that sounds as, as good as it can get uh, to me. No other alternative comes to mind. I I don't, I couldn't possibly see how another way that could have resolved. No. Mm-mm. Hamaliel, do you typically need to put a hole in a hotel wall in order to get your job done? Yes. That's not true. <laughs> yes, that's yes, it not. Is. I've been on five jobs, and I've put holes in every wall in every job. That's, that's, that's the prop, that's, oh, you need smoke, large, billowing black puffs of smoke emerging from the top and sides of Ayer's head. Respectfully, argumentation over logistics and bureaucracy are not solving this case. All right, fair. 
still very mad, but is obviously trying to, like, conceal some manner of his frustration from you in this moment as he turns to you. Do you have any resolution for the current issue at hand? We have obtained a great deal of information. Does that help you ensure that we don't succumb to the apocalypse? Yes. Cool. Would you like to give me any of that information now? I am happy to do so. Exposition! <laughs> I think, uh, as Tempo explains, Jane is using one gloved hand to write on the whiteboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, this, hmm, this kind of makes some sense. So. so, Aya is like staring at the board now and goes, so the Beatographs obviously want this, but they don't just want it because it is theoretically beautiful. They want it because it helps them achieve a goal. Obviously, that assumption should be the Veiled Gentleman has the capacity to grant the core desire of the Beatographs, which is to beautify. Everything else? I don't know, including where it went or why. There is a additional party. Mas Ooh. Masked individuals. I have reason to believe they are not associated with the Beatographs. Not as <laughs> Hmm. Weren't they... Weren't they with... Didn't they come with... Whoever attacked you? So I, Mike, don't remember, but I do remember... Like, Go ahead. I was like, I don't think they... I'm trying to also remember that. Out of character, so not being Homalia currently... Um, I'm pretty sure the nasty lady just bamps into the alleyway in front of slash behind you um, to cut you off. So technically speaking, not strictly associated with the theatographs. Yeah, because Collins and company had been being followed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before the theatographs showed up. Right, so the people that uh, Collins and company described were those cloaked masked figures. They've never seen the woman in pink. But the woman in pink summoned them when she arrived at the hotel. So she's, it's reasonable to assume that she's associated with the, with the Beatographs, but the only person who'd know that is Ciara, because Ciara is the only person who's seen all of them. So, do we want to review our keys now, or kind of stay in the scene a bit longer? Because I'm role-playing the scene essentially as Ayer talking through the information that you have all had, mm. in the hopes of also discovering, in particular, um, what the door of power might be, and what it has to do with the fact that the core of the statue is gone. So if we want to go over the keys that we have so far... Mm. Uh... So some of these are a lot longer because I wasn't totally sure which part was the key. Mm. 
the, the well, big yeah, one. All of, a lot of these things have incredible detail that I appreciate because that's how my brain works. I'm sure if Ray the Jaddy is watching this game right now, he's going, why is everything so detailed? <laughs> I think the ones that, that leap out as the most important to me right now are the origin of the sculpture mm. notch. Yeah. Um, there's the memory of um like the the iridescent not shadow thing that transforms everything around it like that's the newest one we've gotten the beauty for beauty's sake yeah uh before that um mm -hmm. Hamaliel shattered one of the the cloaked figures lockets and then inside that locket was the photo of the husband the wife and the child uh they were the ones or one of the adults that like we had found was in the photo with like the photo included one of the figures that we were engaged with. Yeah. Um, whose face had like a count of Monte Cristo style mask, but the face is covered in tattoos that are meant to resemble scars. And so I think like the first one is like the, uh, the origin of the Pitman sculpture is like the power of the MacGuffin. The nine is the function and the seven is the who. But based on what comes before that, I don't know anything that leads us to like what the door do or how you turn it on or where it might have gone. That's yeah, where I am as a like person. The people muttering, wanting to be beautiful, like the the cocoon imagery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that what you mentioned there, Audrey, seems to be stuff that reinforces the idea of beauty for beauty's beauty's sake. So like yeah. that might be just. Here's I mean, the process the, the, of people getting zombified into beautiful things. Because um, yeah, the, the whole thing with the, the sculptures, it was so beautiful that the person couldn't look away from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the, the beauty it gives slash creates is all-consuming mm -hmm. and, um, like, entropic. Mm -hmm. Right? The previous owners were kind of surrounded by overwhelming destructive beauty. And then we have this iridescence, which is in that same air vein. Perhaps one way we could move forward is see if we can identify the people in the locket, because right now it doesn't seem like we have anything that points us to a location or a person. Right. Because the, the, the scar tattooed person could be the harbinger. We also know that the veiled gentleman is a potential harbinger mm -hmm. um like that that entity that kind of mirrors the sculpture could be the harbinger so i can point out two things that i think would be valuable things to follow up on mm -hmm. um both are pieces of information that i'm sure in context only tempo knows well, no. Mm. Ah, there's a thing that Jane can help with. That's very cool. One is Tempo knows the location of the last place that August Pittman did any creative work. Which is valuable because it is a place that made the where the Pittman sculpture was made, where the real gentleman was made. And two there is a key member that is more valuable to identify the woman in pink who both of you have seen and jane having seen her means that jane can physically recreate her it's true and make a statue a statue a statue so if we think the does it go back to where it started? Is this one of those things? Like the statue, it has been transported back to its home plate or whatever. And we know the cult is aware of it. Then that leads to, well, we're not allowed to knock down any more buildings. We can infiltrate. Is that along the allowed list? August Are you asking Aya? Yeah. <laughs> Aya immediately goes, it doesn't matter to me how you get into places, so long as when you get to places, you don't make a mess. Okay, so lots of flexibility on the into the place, real strict I... on the out of the place. I'm, I'm... Yes, something like 
something like I feel like you've created a loophole that's going to cause me a headache later on but I don't want to have to think about it right now he's touching his temples and you can see the backs of his hands catch fire well I, I know barbecue I I mean I know how I can pull this kind of thing off at that point, you can kind of see like a, it's not like a, a sh it's, it's a bit of a shimmer, but there's some of that like um, all that's coming to mind is like total recall when the skin is kind of shifting around and you can kind of see Jane like as they're thinking about it, different parts of her face and her body are kind of like kind of popping around like as they're trying to like uh, noodle their way through it. <laughs> noodle literally kind of like pasta. Um, I don't know if that solves the problem for the three of you. Infiltration usually isn't my strong suit. We must get there before whatever becoming that cannot be stopped occurs. I mean, I'm, I'm good at causing problems. I could, if we knew where they might be, I could always try to delay them. I'm good at looking like a 12 year old child. People let children in everywhere. I think as this conversation is happening, can I roll for uh, man of a thousand faces? Well, person of a thousand faces, I suppose, more appropriate. Uh, because on a success, I can gain the memories and thoughts of whoever I look like, which I feel like might come in handy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paula. <laughs> yes, let's do this. That can also go terribly wrong. So uh, you have to declare darkness tokens before you spend, right? Yeah. You, you have to spend darkness tokens before you roll, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. um, and then you spend bonds to change the roll afterward. Remember uh, you have a bond with uh, me, I think, still? And... Uh, yeah, I have with Sierra and with Hamaliel. I have two with each of you. Yes, and now because of my new move, you can modify that bond by plus or minus three instead of one. So mm -hmm. I have clicked spend and roll. Okay. A seven is a miss. So if you spend the bond one, and... <laughs> one bond with um Hamaliel, you will get the ten. I would like to get yeah, okay. So then let's um let's say that it's this way. Uh the experience with this this uh uh this pink dressed woman is so emotionally fraught. Uh like whatever lingers in that memory, um I'm assuming that like Jane is kind of osmosed most of it. So in trying to zero in on this, they can feel like tempo's momentary decision making panic as like, do I beat the person or do I, do I hold on the thing they can feel like the uncontrolledness coming out of Ciara as they they enter into this fight like knowing what they're giving up in themselves and like that it's just something raw underneath and they can feel just like the empty expanse of the universe that possesses Hamaliel when Hamaliel when she goes into uh her her rage and like it's not only extremely emotionally confusing to have all those things happening at once, but it's a really uncomfortable look into like the inside of the people who uh, Jane works with. So then the question I would ask is like, and you can see John's like struggling with this, and like at various points, like uh, I want to think it's kind of like traumatic, right? Like the the mouth is trying to form, but then like you can hear like Tempo's voice, and like you can you can tell it's it's not going super great. So if we spend that bond, what would you say Hamaliel does to like anchor the moment and um and bring it back together? So one of the things that Hamaliel has as the power of darkness is emotional amplification. So they reach out and take Jane's hand, give it a little pat, 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 three little pats, and the pat becomes the rhythm of your breathing. The pat becomes the rhythm of the heart. The pat becomes the metronome of the breath of the universe and the emptiness that stretches between atoms. The pat becomes the emptiness that stretches between stars. 
The pat becomes the beat of things coming into endings. The pat becomes what becomes all things that begin and all things that end. And Molly says, don't worry, you make it. Uh, and so like you can see the things like it's 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 speeding up. So it's it's in time with that beat, but then it becomes half notes and quarter notes and 16th notes as it starts to kind of settle. And then when Jane emerges blinking from this, uh, the outfit doesn't change, but the rest of the body is now this this pink dressed woman, but stuffed into a hot topic, uh, essentially. <laughs> Uh, and just kind of blinking uh, forward, well, I guess down towards Homalio. Okay. Um, so on that 10, the thoughts and memories come together in song and your form harmonizes with it. Choose two. Um, I would like to choose that the shape and form is stable and will last as long as I can maintain it or as I can maintain concentration on it. Uh, and then second, that I gain the memories, because that was the thing that we we wanted to do. Uh, I really hope that this person thought real long and hard about the path to their secret hideout and the passwords they use and the security measures and, <laughs> right? Please let um, this nasty lady be the IT manager of this entire cult. That would be great <laughs> for us right now. Mm hmm So... You enter into the the physical space of the memories of a young woman named Whitney Bailey. The moment in which you the you catch her memories is moments before she flees her fight with Tempo. In fact, so you see the last few moments that she saw Tempo and you at the back of the hotel. And through her eyes, you see her focus on Tempo and you feel like this weird flush of intense admiration bordering on like Somewhere between the affection that someone might mistake for love at first sight and the uh, intense reverence for, like, a high-class celebrity uh, as she focuses on Tempo in this moment, who is, like, cool. Uh, but some of that cool is kind of wearing off for her, but it's still very cool. But she still knows that she's here for a thing. And like she briefly focuses on the thing. And that's when you see that you hadn't noticed. But she does notice that the shape of the statue is moving in the box. It, like... First, it kind of like splats against one of the edges of the glass case as if it is trying to push itself out. And then it makes this like rapid kind of fractalizing shape inside as if it's kind of bubbling under some kind of heat or magnetic interference. Um, and then... <coughs> It takes its shape again, and Whitney notices, looking at it, that it is still a veiled figure, but it doesn't have its top hat anymore. And, like, this is mere moments um, in the middle of making, in the middle of the decision that Whitney finally makes to make the tree that rushes up towards Tempo so she can flee. But she doesn't do that. She doesn't finally decide that she needs to actually get out of here until she squints at that figure in that case and realizes that its shoulders 
and like from the shoulder to the lapel of this new new figure, she can make out like the collar and the lapel of what looks like a uniform that has appeared somewhere before. And that's when she realizes there's like this silver name tag pin uh, right near the lapel. And you can't make out what's on it. You can just make out that this looks like a shape that you've seen before. And that's when she realizes it. And you, John, you realize what this is to yourself around the same time that Whitney has the memory that confirms it for you. This is a diner waitress uniform. So she makes the tree and leaves. God damn it. Um, I think for everyone else in the room, this takes the form of John monotone reading the screenplay version. Mm -hmm. um, if you've seen uh, Minority Report, the way that the precogs discuss the crimes as they are happening is just that. Um, and also, like, eyes empty, no thoughts. So, like, when the final bit happens, uh, what Whitney says as the religion happened goes to waitress uniform, but like monotone, not even like more monotone than that. And that's the end of the memory, at which point Jane clicks back on and is making eye contact with, I guess, I like tempo, you're fairly close at this point, and she goes, fuck. And that's how you know that the memory has ended because the animation happens again. Right. So I, out of character, think we we can make the the move because to make mm -hmm. to make unlock death store we have to connect at least one key to each facet mm -hmm. and i think we i think we can find something that goes with every facet um, but that's how in or out of character we do that i don't know well i think uh let me pull up this Thing again because i gotta find the facets i mean i like doing this in character because aya is here looking at the board also to clarify the diner uniform is a key okay there are so many keys oh my god i love just giving you all details <laughs> i think with the epiphany of the waitress uniform it kick like it serves as an adequate springboard for the post office service representatives to jump into action yeah so i think it is a good enough like narrative place for us to hit the mechanics so to speak okay mm -hmm. um, brandon do you want to read out the process or shall we have someone else do it i would like aubrey to do it the uh, unlock doom's door right when you're ready to declare what the door is and how to unlock it, say what you believe it to be. Connect keys to the facets of the mystery, revealing the harbinger. Roll and add the number of connected keys minus the mystery's complexity. This roll is not affected by darkest token, darkness tokens, bonds, or any other move. Uh, shall we roll before we say what the 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 roll things are? Um, I think well, we... we need to state what the connected keys are first. Mm, true. Right. So, this one I think is easy. What's the harbinger? Is it the sculpture? Yeah. Is it... yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And the, 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 and the origin. Yeah, the, and the origin is the good uncovered key for that. I mm -hmm. I would actually argue that the door of power is a better match for the origin because the place where the sculpture was made seems like a good place for the door, but that ephemeral image of cocoons in and out of a chrysalis could go with the harbinger because it seems to be in fluctuation. Aha, uh -huh, also fair, yes. So yeah, I'm going to move number three over to by the harbinger, uh, and then somebody else. Should we do lines instead? Oh no, this works. So long as it is legible for all involved. Okay. I'm just gonna move the clock down a little bit here. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can move it to a... Uh... 
if you could put it behind, that would also be cool. Yeah, but it's yes. now on the GM layer, so you have to control it. Uh -huh. So you were describing the the harbinger with the cocoon picture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from there, um, so so uh, Tempo says that, and I think at this point Jane is going along, and and we know the cult can use this to to bring about their terrible beauty of the universe and then with every kind of like syllable flashing through the faces of cultists they've met or beautiful things they've uh, beautiful people they've seen uh so then i would connect the where to go sorry i have it it's right here uh, yeah, number six, the three people chanting with monotone focus, we will make this world beautiful again is the first one. But I think because I because I think nine, well, if no, if we're using three for the harbinger, then I would use nine um, for the goal of the beatographs. Yeah. 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 That the iridescent not shadows, uh, that is the goal. They want to unleash that thing and let it do it do. When it comes mm -hmm. to the goal of the buyers, I feel like that five is the most immediate obvious because it says like they were just art collectors mm -hmm. who yeah. kind of stepped into something that was just much bigger than themselves. Yeah. And last but not least, uh, the door of power. The uh, origin of the sculpture, mm -hmm. or at least where it is located. In yeah, where it's located. Mm -hmm. Hmm. yeah like mm -hmm. yeah i mean that's that is definitely good because then we can get the uh i mean honestly uh six is still like the goal of the be autographs we will make the world beautiful again so that's yeah. connected to that there are a great deal of details that you can add specifically about the beatographs still um, i feel like the locket probably is attached to them as well Mm -hmm. um just in terms of oh leaving the mundane world behind and becoming um part of this cult yeah both the mask and the tattoos are valuable information there mm. um the uh diner crowd murmuring one could be beautiful is part of the harbinger mm -hmm. and we should probably have no further ideas lest we risk throwing our number too high <laughs> Seven. We have seven, I believe. Mm -hmm. So we get a plus three. I mean, uh, Tempo, what is your tenure on this team but a disastrous success, quite true frankly? Story. <laughs> yeah. I'll and... just roll all ones. I want to think, like, narratively, it makes sense. Like, if this is the big moment for this team and, like, for for uh, Jane and Himalia and Ciara, like, finally getting a mystery right's a big deal. So I feel like <laughs> they might oversell it or at yeah. least, like, lack the confidence to keep going. So it makes sense to me why they would keep to the point of that, but I don't want to make that decision for everybody. We are the Z team. That's one way to put it, yes. I was having fun. Uh -oh.
Aya looks at Tempo and goes, all of those are words that you used. They're English words. I have no idea. Do you know where you're going next? I know how to get there. Okay. I mean, you blew up your last transport, I guess. So if you need a way in or out of somewhere, the least I can do is give you one door. After that, you're on your own. Well, yeah, if we survive, we can make our own way back. Might take a little bit, but we'll make our own way back. Please survive. Don't make a mess in order to survive, but please survive. But Ayer, you said that my existence was a mess. I did, didn't I? Yeah. Uh... Sure. <laughs> yes. Bye, Aya. Okay. Tempo makes that joke, and then Jane laughs, but it's in the pink woman's voice, and he's not used to it. So she's mm. like, <laughs> 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 and then... Yeah, that was also a lot. Jeez. Um, so, mechanically, are you going to roll now? Yes. Yes, it makes roll. sense. Yeah. Come on, Aubrey, you can do it. Cool, yeah. In Pass fact, I'm going to ask John to roll. Oh, don't put this yeah. on me. Well, you're the face <laughs> of the nasty lady now. Oh, yeah. that's right, I guess. I... You're the face mm -hmm. of the group. You've got to roll. I am the faces of so, the party. The roll now is 2d6 plus 7 minus 4, which is 2d6 plus 3. 2d6 plus 3? Yeah. Oh, how is that possible? I rolled a 7. Oh. oh, can we spend bonds on those? This cannot be modified by uh, yeah. to darkness ah, tokens or bonds. Yeah. I rolled a one and a three plus the three. Oh, ouch, ouch, ouch. Not, I, I told you. Uh, <laughs> that's okay, that's okay. Tempo promised us destruction ahead. This is good. This is mm -hmm. So, okay, good. so all of this... All of this is still valuable. This is not a sign that bad things have happened yet. On a seven on a seven or less, the door remains hidden. The theory was the wrong one. Each PC marks one ruin. Oh. In addition, precious time is lost. In addition, precious time is lost, and the doomsday clock ticks forward. So the two, the doomsday clock is now three of four. Oh, fantastic. So we can't get that wrong again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then I guess what when it says that we were wrong, what part of this is wrong? Because that will then lead us to know what we need to fix. The thing that is wrong, and so hmm, mechanically and narratively, I feel like this is supposed to play out a certain way. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is you act on the information that you have right now under the assumption, therefore, that the door of power is Pitman's barn. And you tell Aya that, and he cuts a fire door for you and opens it, and you are looking into the barn. There is no barn. Uh-oh. This entire property has been raised ages and ages ago. Um, it dawns on you, Tempo, that you wouldn't have seen this because the last thing that you saw was just repo men coming for the property inside. But since this place has been sold, it's just been arable. It's just been unused arable land now. Even Ayer is confused. He's like, typically when I open a door, I'm opening a door. Like, I've never... I mean... I guess if I'm cutting the door in front of me, it can open anywhere, even if there's not a door. But this typically leads to another door. Um, yeah, that's not... That's not right. Hmm. You may have to reconsider a thing. John, it occurs to you that even though this is not the door of power... 
there is still an op there is a, there is still obviously an answer that is available to you. It occurs to you like like a flash of lightning. The diners the diners waitress uniform is the door of power. Or rather, the waitress is. So the in 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 a very fast forwarded version, like Jane's upset by this. She is reading through this kind of script again. It's faster and faster and faster. So you get the sense of like someone speeding through it, kind of mumbling, flipping through pages as trying to go through the memories and then discarding things left and right. Uh, uh, the, the, the pink dressed woman getting like increasingly manic in her face as John gets closer and closer and closer. Uh, and then finally, it's just like, a, but if it can't be, no, it was here. And we thought it was here. So what else is the thing? And then he's like, focusing 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 and i think that's the point where like he's touching across like her chest and stuff like like physically trying to interact with the memory about where the things are and then like squeezes down on the actual uh badge and that's when kind of like no it's not a place it's a person where it started who was the first we went to the diner. Everything was wrong there except for one thing. And we just, like, look, we wrote it off that the, the, the waitress was just lucky, but what if the waitress wasn't lucky? What if the waitress was the reason? That makes sense. You're, ha you're having this thought, by the way, and as you're speaking, your face slowly starts shifting from Whitney's to the waitresses. And as it happens, you're realizing not because you're tapping into the memories of that moment when she touched you, but purely as a process of doing the math, it occurs to you. It's happening because the veiled gentleman, whether it's the creature itself or just it trapped in the statue, likes how the waitress looks and that feels icky to you on so many levels take two darkness tokens Ooh. well what happens if that number gets too high bad things well, then you have i a, mean bad a, things happen when it hits a particular number what number is it now then you have uh, a harbinger time now i'm at six oh uh, well, isn't it if you have five left over after a move after a thing right 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 so i can mm -hmm. so i can spend my way out of it if we mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. although i could really mess this does up does it also say... trigger when you hit it i think it also triggers when you hit it i could really mess this up though so... because i also gain two to four when i feel frustrated or scared and for john to go off on a limb and be like i've solved this mystery everybody follow me and then to be wrong that's right. gonna be frustration uh, so the tr triggers for torn between are when you have five or more darkness tokens after a move when you are tempted by what the darkness demands of you and when you are torn between your monstrous nature and your human heart aha uh -huh. okay because you didn't make a move um we shall wait which means that whenever you make a move next um you should probably will spend tokens. be spared, which becomes incredibly challenging as a result, obviously, because now you have the opportunity to unlock Doom's door again, which is a move that is not affected by darkness tokens. Yes, yeah, so so I think someone else should do ask it. You to do that. So I'm going to ask you to do that. <laughs> uh, nope, narratively, it's John again, because John came to the revelation. This is the one time I'll ever be mean as a GM, but narratively, it counts. I deserve it. And then also with the feeling scared or frustrated, that's like a three, so I'm sitting on nine. There's really no way that, that this stays together. Uh, mm -hmm. We roll the same number of keys, right, with the three? Uh, um, like plus seven minus four, so it's a plus three on the roll? Right. I'm going to give you an option based on the logic of the situation. The discovery that you have essentially made is that the origin of the Pitman sculpture and the revelation about the barn that has about the barn and the farm that has been shared with you previously is still information about the Harbinger that is still valuable. 
you have just gained new information about the door of power, which means that if you want, you can roll plus four. But I'm going to make it your choice. Essentially, you're deciding whether to factor the farm in at all because the farm no longer exists. Oh, absolutely. Like, Jane's not logical. Jane screams at her boss. Jane makes light of small situations. Jane rides the elevator instead of fighting evil. Like, that absolutely will be the case that there's there's no safety thought here. Jane is just unbridled whatever. Did skip the uh the detective schooling part of division and went kind of straight to work. Uh so I will roll the plus four and I will get Oh boy. Oh boy indeed. <laughs> We're gonna get to... So a thing just happened and you're gonna learn the results of that we're going to have a conversation after this break. <laughs> uh, so we will be right back uh, after a very short intermission. Um, a, a reminder to you all, of course, to take care of yourself in this moment as well, as we uh, will uh, replenish our monstrous bodies for a brief moment uh, before we return to more of the Pitman Sculptia. We'll be back in a moment, folks.
Hello everyone, and we are back with more of the Pikmin Sculptia, uh, our uh, special Apocalypse Keys mini-series co-authored by two members of Queen's Court Games here on, us, here on Speculate. Um, when we last left off, uh, the folks of the post office were at the post office putting together all of the details that they have already gained about uh the veiled gentleman after discovering that the gentleman that's supposed to be under the veil is not under the veil um at which point they thought that they all knew where the door of power was until jane discovered a thing acted on that information and is about to face the consequences of acting on that information <laughs> so uh. Jane, you are torn between. Would you like to roll for that? Uh, so, uh, when you are torn between your monstrous nature and your human heart, make a choice. Uh, you either let your monstrous nature show and describe the damage your outburst caused, marking one ruin. You can describe how you diminish your power and conform to the pressures of humanity, losing all darkness tokens, or you can spend a bond with someone describe how they directly or inadvertently help you regain control. How many darkness tokens do you have at the moment? Nine. Uh, cool, that's grand. I And I need but... to shed them. I, I desperately need to shed them. Yeah, dropping all of those would be particularly valuable. Uh, and I, I think that it takes the form of We've leaned, we collectively as a team have leaned really hard on Jane's ability to grab memories, to borrow faces, to to do the thing that really Jane is the most afraid of. Uh, it, it's the reason that they are so adamant about knowing who you are, like structurally, like bones and skin. Uh, because when those things start to bleed, it gets weird. And having accumulated all of these these stressors and memories, it's getting really noisy up there and it's getting really confusing to like separate what is actually John and what is this this blender of other. Uh, and with that number of darkness tokens, I feel like that manifests in like the, the conduit between Jane and the thing that they are meant to serve is is wide open the the aperture of darkness like cinematically behind about to swallow is a lot um so it's it's a choice to give up power because all those faces are faces that they can draw upon later it's how we did this that's what makes jane useful but the choice is between being useful and dangerous or being not useful and in this case there's just too much pain around for Jane to make any kind of help other people decision. Right now, all that matters is that he needs it out of them. Uh, so I will I will burn those nine darkness tokens to go back to zero. Um, <clears throat> I think at this point, Jane is still in the visage of the pink dressed woman. Uh, and then just like light bulb wise, that snaps out. But with it, all the kind of like other specific face and, and memories that have been attached to those that pain, those that emotional mess. Mm -hmm. What face do you wear now after all of that is gone? So uh this is where the kind of mo the monstrous nature comes in a bit that we, we've essentially rebooted uh Jane's chat GPT face generator. So there's that moment where the the mask that we haven't had on for a while because of the need to do this stuff, uh, you see what's under it again. And the under is is nothing. It's not an empty hole. It is just blank. Uh, but not not like like a mannequin, yes, but also like it is blank in the way a canvas is blank in that it could be anything. And your mind can wander and project different features into it in a way that is like uh, kind of like like vertigo, but uh, emotional, like uncanny valley vertigo ness, because you don't know what's there. Um, I think all of this happens. You see it. Jane doesn't know what's happening until, like, everything kind of clears and they find a sense of themselves again. 
and you see uh like the concentration for the gloves actually drops and they just kind of flop flop onto the ground as Dreen is scrambling for their pockets looking for the mask and like trying to put it back up onto their face uh Amaliel picks up the gloves and um uh tactfully looks away from the not face while also kind of peeking at the knock face. Uh, and when Jane comes back, Hamaliel gives um, his hands back, which is a very weird sentence to say now that I've actually said it, and says, you look the way the solar system looked when it started. That uh, is so cool you say because that was actually what was in my head is like the feeling you get looking at John is the feeling you get looking up at the sky and not being able to comprehend how big the universe is. So it's really, really mm -hmm. cool that we're on the same page there. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane is not that insightful mm -hmm. um, and just kind of blinking into it and, and just kind of swallowing that realization down, uh, the weight of void and such. Um. I don't think they articulate it, but you can probably see in the eyes that inadvertently Hamaliel has articulated the thing that like Jane is most aware and afraid of, that like the infiniteness is like is the problem. So it's like, yeah, I I do. But like weighty and in a bad way. Nothingness, I embrace you. That was me, not Hamalio, by the way. Oh, Lord. Okay. You have that very intense emotional moment. Um, it feels afterward... It feels very much physically like wind is rushing out of your head after you uh, have that uh, moment of uh, emotional intensity uh, before you recover. Like when your ears I... pop the day after an airplane flight. Mm hmm. But it pops, and then you just hear loud noises rushing out of your ears instead of just the pop. And then after you finally come back to you. You remember everything that you have just learned. Your role for unlocking Doom's door was a perfect hit. What happens when you perfect hit on unlocking Doom's door? On a perfect hit. Oh, I've moved this window down too far and I can't scroll far enough. I've ruined it. Ha ha ha. On an 8 through a 10, you have tracked down Doom's door. You know exactly where it is and how to unlock it. In addition, the Keeper will present an opportunity to protect what matters most, take down the Harbinger, or otherwise drive back the Apocalypse. So, you know this first? Well, you, you know this and have the capacity within the post office to get there immediately um, so you haven't really lost much time even though you are aware that the beatographs are headed in that direction immediately after leaving the hotel hmm. and There's you know okay. and you know just as much as Whitney does is there anything I will give you the opportunity precisely because I need to present an opportunity to you. Is there a thing that you'd like me to offer you? Is there something that you'd like to know or act upon that gaining more information from me or allowing me to think about will prevent will present for you? Um, I think two things inform this choice for me. I think one, uh, Jane has just had uh, a too long handshake with what lies at the end of their ruin track. And then two, uh, Hamaliel had in, in an attempt to be to be sweet has actually made a, a like a reinforcing reminder of that. 
because John is having this, wow, I am an empty void of destruction. And Hamaliel is like, you look like the empty void of destruction I'm from. <laughs> and like those things have hit together. So I don't think that like the opportunity to protect what matters most doesn't make sense to me because right now John doesn't want to have anything to protect wants to be as far away from everything. The specific harbinger tied to the, the, the Pikmin trophy is like, yes, attractive, but I think otherwise drive back the apocalypse because it's also Jane's apocalypse that they're worried about. So I think in this in this meta universe we've established, there are things trying to bleed their way into our world or to reshape the reality. And one of them is the, the veiled figure that belongs to this model. And the other is also Jane's stepdad. So I feel like there, if there's something that connects those two things or like a universal truth that applies to those, that is the direction that, that Jane would be trying to, to revelate in. Aha. Let's see if this works. Um, I'm going to offer this essentially to the group because at this point, Jane has already presented this information to everyone. Um, and I'm going to give everyone an opportunity to discuss in character or out of character and veto out of character. Um, but what stands to me is this. Jane, you're in a particular circumstance that is really interesting compared to the, ve the Veiled Gentleman. And interestingly, Tempo is as well, where both of you have witnessed especially during this case, the intense reality warping consequences of seeking beauty over truth, of attempting to recreate or value false attractiveness in the face of dealing with what is genuinely there. It stands to reason to both of you, especially Jane, in this moment, that especially because of what the darkness demands of you, it is put it is very frighteningly enticing and therefore obviously worth pushing back against. That a part of you does in fact value seeking that beauty, perhaps being able to settle on a version of that beauty such that you never have to worry about any of this again. Um, and for Tempo, a lot of that struggle is what you have witnessed of the world is in fact very spiritually ugly, but you know that visually beauty does not suppress that spiritual ugly. But you're reckoning with the fact that you live in a world where everybody else thinks that it does. And, you, and that's what... In your head, th those are the gears that are turning about why the Beatographs do what they do, that they think that this beauty is the same as goodness. Um, and seeing what making a rash decision like that, making a rash decision about what is uniquely good in the face of actual truth has done on Relayam. Maybe you don't want to do that or have other people do it. Um, so that's those are similar but di distinct thoughts that both of you are having in the moment that you learn where Doom's Door actually is. When you get there, you are consciously aware of the fact that some manner of the apocalypse will ask for both of you to answer the question, obviously with your bodies, of what is more valuable between beauty and truth in a way that will ask you to make a rash decision. You have no idea what that rash decision is yet, but it will, it will be called for you to do. Knowing that beforehand means that you have a choice. When you get there, 
do you want to know what's behind Doom's door, or do you want to make sure that it cannot be opened? I'm just seeing the smile uh, <laughs> on your face. <laughs> yeah, podcast-wise, I'm like, oh, those are both so good. Sorry, people listening in audio medium, you cannot see me visually struggle with this. It is a but... very good visual struggle. The struggle is visual, friends. So do we, and this is like a kind of scene pitch, is there some part of the scene or some shared understanding po probably coming from Jane's like emotional antennae where we have that prompt as a conversation while or before things unfold so that it's in character and Brandon does that moment go here or should it go later it it happens in travel, okay. but it's a matter of psychic feedback between Jane and Tempo as you go through Ayer's door. Hmm. So it doesn't happen yet. Think, process that moment before, uh, before I give you the opportunity to actually roleplay it. Because as that's happening, I'm like, Jane in that moment of like the awe of recovering from this state, um... Hamaliel, you are looking at uh, Jane, like, still reeling from the actual experience, but now briefly in awe of the discovery that they've just made. And then Aya snaps his fingers. Uh, is anyone going to tell me what to do now, or... Jane, think... the last thing that you would have obviously let anybody know is that the that the waitress was valuable. We haven't actually stated to anyone else where the door of power is. Oh, did I not? I thought. Sorry, I, no. You I... were still you were still having a time, obviously. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've, I've been having a time for a good two and a half hours, um, and and just for me because I, I I'm Aaron says that it is in the diner attached mm -hmm. to the woman so i don't want to okay uh then that's gonna be really funny because jane still having a time and thinking or assuming i suppose that they have just been blurting things out this whole time and that everybody else does know is um like the kid who's daydreaming in class and just kind of assumes that someone else will answer and then at some point looks up to find all four other people staring mm -hmm. at them and is just kind of uh, blinking a minute and goes like, the, with the waitress, the diner, as if this should be self-evident because they have all the information that you don't, they don't know they haven't shared it. Oh no, that's no good. We left that diner so long ago. We could have burned it down when we had the chance. Well, we'll have that chance. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> no, Ciara, no. Uh, so wait, why the, the diner is beautiful? No, no, the woman inside it She is... was the only one who wasn't changed. Oh. Like Jane reflexively reaches for that face, but has just thrown it away and can't find it, so. <laughs> we were right there. <laughs> Okay, I'm. Uh, this makes no sense to me, but I'm gonna take you to the diner. Don't make a mess. He already starts opening a door to the diner. Um, the door of the post office is now aflame. If you uh, open it, it will take you to the diner immediately. Uh, seeing as Hamaliel and Ciara seem to have narratively established themselves as the chaos causers of this team, Hamaliel grabs uh, Ciara's hand and like runs through the door because Hamaliel's just thinking we need to get to the diner as mm. a waitress lady. Yeah, we're, sure we we why. we don't know we don't understand the full full breadth of everything. It's like no. okay, it's at the diner with the waitress who wasn't changed. Yeah, and that Ciara didn't 
burned down and that we can now burn down again and that I smashed the double doors to with the limo door. We need to get there. We have no idea what you're we're yelling about. Let's go. Yep. Um, I don't know how long this process takes, but I want to pitch that like tempo. I'm assuming as team dad is making sure everyone has used the bathroom and packed their things before we all go through the door. So Sierra and Hamali will tear off and then John is supposed to be next in line, but instead is waiting and like kind of making a really thoughtful eye contact for like a really good pregnant second. And then uh, with your consent, Mike, I would like to use you can't hide your heart from me to uh, deep. So uh, you are sensitive to the surface thoughts and strongest feelings of those around you. When you deepen your senses, spend darkness tokens and roll. Because Jane knows what's going on with Sierra and Hamaliel. Uh, they are fairly transparent. But the disappointment from the first thing has happened. And then also, like, Sierra and Hamaliel have understood and recognized, like, what Jane is. But this is, like, you have now had time to process it. And before we go once more into the breach, my friend, John wants to know how Tempo feels about him. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Go for it. I don't have any darkness tokens, so I will just roll. Got it. Uh, <clears throat> I have rolled poorly again. Mm -hmm. That was a you miss still have for those though. listening. Hmm? You still have other bonds, though, so you can turn this miss, this six, into any other number you want. Uh, it just depends on if you want to do it in uh, factors of one or factors of three. Right. Yeah. I think um, I have that, that point with Hamaliel, and this will be a lesson learned. Um, because there's one thing that Jane is really, really bad about, and that is communicating anything that is emotionally complicated. And there are lots of different ways to solve that problem. And Hamaliel's favorite way is to be direct, blunt, and use as few words with as few syllables as possible. So Jane channels Hamaliel's verbal t pose <laughs> to just cut straight to the core of the thing and like you see like, like if it if like if it's a movie like you see like the moment where you're just gonna like work up to the big speech and be like tempo i know we're new with it but instead <laughs> it's just like do you think i'm a fuck up or like just something like really straightforward cut to the point mm -hmm. which would turn it into a nine um and i get to ask two uh i want the options to be uh, what do you wish would happen? And how can I make you trust me? Because hmm. I think both of those can get us to the, right. the thing. Yeah. And so this is about this, the thoughts and feelings beneath the surface. So what I'm going to pitch is that Jane finds himself inside kind of tempos emotional like uh it's like what if a mind palace was more feelingsy um mm -hmm. and because it's temporal like because there's all this time magic it's very timey wimey and that like uh the things that you see you use 3d glasses to see there's stuff that's like slightly offset and so you adjust and you can see basically through time and the thing that uh, that John is seeing as they kind of look around within this space is ruin and then little oases of joyful memories that have been like mentally reassembled and glued back together, rewound to a moment um i'm reminded of the film inside out where there's a late uh late revelation that important joyful memories flow from sad memories and that you have to go through the emotion before you can kind of reach the thing beyond and that 
for tempo in this moment, they are trying to console themselves with the notion that all of these apocalypses that have come before are not final for everything. That you can have a personal apocalypse, you can have a social apocalypse, and but memory persists, and that as long as people keep moving forward and keep trying to protect one another, that it's not the the final ending. And so what Tempo wishes would happen, wants to happen, is that this is a downswing, but it is not the end, period, close the book, set it on fire. And Tempo is kind of like looking into the future, imagining possible futures, and a number of them play out very poorly. You know, in this version, Hamaliel destroys the entire um, the entire diner, but it cracks open the earth, and apocalypse happens. In this next version, um, Sierra is fighting the Harbinger and having to draw more deeply, more deeply, more deeply on her power, and consumes herself in the flame. And Tempo is helpless to stop it. And then in another version the similar desperation comes for uh, com comes for John. Hamaliel is knocked out of time. Ciara is consumed, but it's not enough. Tempo reaches too deeply into the past and gets swallowed by it. And so it's just Jane and panicked. The whole room, the whole town, and then the whole country becomes puppets. And Jane can tell in that moment that Tempo will trust John and will continue to trust Jane as long as they know that Jane has hope. I think then the the response to that and this answers the question of truth uh, and beauty is born of false hope that the the beauty version here is is the lie the truth for tempo is that the world they want is never coming back and as the, the beauty version of that would be I can I can use all the might of the time in the cosmos to fix that and I can make all the struggles right one by one by one. But that's going to create the idealized version that Tempo remembers. It's the version that Tempo remembers that has already that, that excludes the worst parts or even the banal parts. The only way that we can be hopeful is to have a true understanding of our place in the world and the future because like in john's case they can be beautiful they have to take from people they can make the world beautiful in a cataclysmic way and it's only by accepting our truths both the pretty ones and the ugly ones that we have the moral clarity and then the full ability to make the decisions that lead us to good places. We can't just polish up the mirror and chase that because that's the delusion that leads you into the abyss. I don't know how John says that in a Hamaliel quip, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, but... I mean, you could say, wow. <laughs> I think that's the that's the shoulder pat message yeah. that that goes um and if it's okay as they step through tempo kind of knowing that they've they've shared you know some some good but not maybe complete ma uh, measure of their emotion says do not forget the life you have lived for that is yours. 
It is not anyone else's. It is you. You are your memories and your actions, not just what you take, willing or unwilling, from others. You have a self. I think all you can see is a, like the mask kind of shifts up on the chin and you can tell that Jane is smiling just by the kind of way that it tilts a little bit. And then uh, a, a very sarcastic but on brand glove salute with two fingers and then John goes to the door. Hell yeah. Before that happens, in this moment, as you're both settling, in this mind palace space, um, as you're both dwelling here very briefly, um, both of you cross over idly into a memory. It's the same memory. Jane, this is the first time that you may have ever seen or witnessed anything of Tempo's home planet that was not relayed to you elsewhere. Both of you share this, like, disembodied sight of Tempo's matriarch. Uh, when this, this, this memory is far older when Tempo was younger, it's technically not something Tempo was even aware of. Um, although, like, there are vagaries of, um, this experience that you may have heard a rumor about or had a conversation with your matriarch about when you got older. In the early days of, like, the industrial establishment of this world, your mother made, was informed politically of a scientific discovery that had the capacity to potentially, like, fast forward the development of this place to a point as far beyond even some of the like vast powers of the world that you had already witnessed before it had fallen apart, but was deeply worried that even though it was not a weapon and was not designed in a way to be incredibly dangerous, that at any point someone would exploit it in a way that would be volatile. As a result, they and a handful of other people who shared the information with them in the first place are the mm -hmm. only people who knew that, that, that it ever existed. And you, like, witness them processing this briefly in, like, their office in your home. Like, all of the devastating ways that this would potentially ruin the world around them. And all of those things, based on, like, the chemical reactions of that object, are, like, manifest as sketches in their mind of people turning into gold statues. And it immediately strikes you, Tempo, as this extreme, jarring version of what you saw happen during the Noise War. And Jane, it strikes you as this vastly visually intense version of what was already happening in the diner before you all left. And then you all get jarred out of that vision just after having that conversation. And may now continue to proceed to the diner as you wish. Uh, I, I think since we had this moment, the only correct thing is a cutaway to whatever terror has been unleashed inside the diner. Yep. <laughs> I imagine the doors that I busted have not been replaced. So... Oh, yeah. 
the doors are gone. I think some shit happened to the windows of the diner as well. I think mm. I can't recall if something was on fire. Nothing was on fire. I did almost brain someone with a plate. Right, yes, that did in fact mm. be cool. One of my angel um, arms actually came out and did some things. Uh. <laughs> it's been a while, so you can't really figure out, but all of you get the, like, that vaguely creepy spine-tingling sense that many of the people who were in the diner when you were previously here have since shifted idly in one direction or another in the direction that they were facing. Um, a police officer has now joined them as an, and is now also frozen. He's not frozen in what seems to be a physical state of ecstasy. He is obviously frightened, but it but he is frozen because somebody has successfully touched him. Um, and the waitress looking... is now wrapped up in what seems to be a cocoon of pink silk. Uh-oh. That definitely seems to be a problem. That's not just one motif. That's like two whole visual motifs. We are in huge trouble here. Mm-hmm. Jane, it strikes you almost as a side thought that if the waitress is the door of power, you have to go through the cocoon to go through it. I'm not going to lie, that sounds gross as hell. <laughs> um, how, uh, chronologically, how, how soon after uh, Hamaliel and Sierra do the other two of us arrive? That, the conversation that you have mentally takes quite a while, but you go through the door a matter of seconds. Okay. So then, I guess my question is, uh, uh, Ciara and Hamaliel, you, you were in there first. You see all this. What, what have you done? Like, what, essentially, what do Tempo and I walk in on? <laughs> well, you see, neither of you were in the house, and we panicked. So. Um, I, don't, I don't think anything is lit. On... Sierra may be slightly on fire. Uh, like, your fire's wreathed her hands. But the diner itself is not on fire yet, because it's like... Uh, is it one of those things where if I burn the thing, it opens the door? Mm, someone said something about that once. <laughs> or is it, or is it destroying the thing? Will definitely close the door forever. Mm, and I'm stuck between these two things of about just be like, mm, mm, no. <laughs> yes, I like to think that when the two of you walk in, you just hear Hamaliel piping up. I think you should burn the cocoon. I mean, are we sure that this, like, I, I, I'm, I'm never one to be the voice of reason, but I did just get yelled at, and I don't want to get yelled at again. I concur, Sierra. So burning? Wait. <laughs> oh, I, you concur in that direction. I apologize. I misunderstood. I took <laughs> your comment as caution. Uh, John Glove hands clapped together in front of him. So, what do we have here? Really fucking creepy cocoon. Is Reminds that me... like peering down into it? Because it's when you said cocoon, I'm imagining chitinous, but also pink, like unmistakably it... pink. Just. Thinking of the the cocoons, the the can cotton candy cocoons from Killer Clowns from Outer Space. God, it is, it is a cocoon. Like you look at it and you notice, like it's doing some of the things that you'd imagine a very large cocoon from like a very large, um, uh, like insect-like creature would be like. It looks like slick with some kind of oil or grease or liquid, um, but otherwise it looks like it's constructed of very fine, very um, like well-woven 
individual strings of something silk soft and just a little bit uh glittery um it looks like the cross between an ordinary insect cocoon and if someone had just been wrapped up in a lot of thread so i can tell very fine very expensive thread and we can tell that it is the waitress uh you can tell from the way from the place that it is that if nothing in this space moved that's the waitress having never actually shifted from that spot at all okay i touch it it feels like something very fine and very expensive is underneath something very oily I don't know if I've had enough life experience to know what that means. We're I start writers. None ripping open the that. cocoon. Hamaliel? Yes. I have a prophecy about me. I don't die today. Unleash your dog for me, please. <laughs> Unleash the dark. Um, I guess I could use darkness tokens if I really wanted to, um, or I could spend bond. I mean, how many darkness tokens do you have? I only have the three. Yeah. I mean, toss one or two in there, like maybe one. Yeah, maybe I'll just throw the one. You should also have two more bonds with me because I've spent mine with you twice. Yes. So I think maybe I'll spend one bond with James. Um so... just because like seeing him in so much existential agony over the lack of self or the void of self makes Hamalia weirdly more herself in a way. Um, but again, in depending on how you look at it, a positive or a negative way, because yeah, I have a prophecy about myself. I know how I die. It's not today. So I'm just going to do this thing because I know it's not going to kill me. Uh, so can I spend a darkness token and then a bond? Or can I only do one or the other? But the bond happens after, so yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do both, but you don't. You might not need to spend the bond. Okay, so click to roll. Woohoo! That's a nine. Cool. Perfect. Aha. Perfect hit. Uh, okay, cool. So you touch the cocoon briefly. You're not thinking anything about it. Um, it just feels like. There has been a, po a moment in time, very briefly, when you first settled on Earth as a creature, where you hadn't learned yet that certain kinds of food needed to be eaten with knives and forks. So you would go to very expensive restaurants and put spaghetti directly into your mouth by hand. It feels to you immediately by touch as if someone had cooked uh, yarn in spaghetti sauce. And that's the thought that you have when you briefly touch it. And then you go, I should get in, I should see what's inside this. And the minute, the minute you think about the idea of opening the cocoon, you are briefly overwhelmed by the feeling of something beautiful is inside here. And if I don't get there, Someone else will get there first and take this beauty from me. I can't let that happen. I need to get inside here now. And then you open it, and immediately that thought disappears. So it sounds to me that at least one of the conditions I get from... Unleash the Dark is avoid reprisals, harm, or cost. 
because it seems like this cocoon was trying to do something nasty to my mind, but I evaded it, so no reprisals. Uh, <laughs> which means we get one more condition. Yes. Uh, I get what I want from them, I gain the upper hand, I expose a weakness or a flaw, or I confuse them. I don't really want to confuse a cocoon. I... Hmm. Theoretically, because this is the door of power, mm -hmm. you may, inf anything that would act upon a person, you can decide it acts upon the harbinger before they even see that you are here. Mm. I think Hamalia as the former law of dissolution. What Hamalia wants from opening the cocoon is... How do you end? Like, what is your ending state? How do I... How do I expedite the anomaly of your existence? Aha! This is grand. So this is a thing that you will learn immediately, because that's how the move works. The cocoon is the door of power. If you destroy the cocoon, you destroy the door of power. This is weird that has multiple stages. A cocoon obviously is a thing that encapsulates a creature with the purpose of that creature metamorphing. Which means that there is a version of completing this task, which is revealing the beauty of this person. You have no idea what that means. All of these things are weird, but you know that's the end state. But you also know that the cocoon is also the metaphysical door of power. And that one, while it still exists and is open, entering it will get you to the other side of the door of power where the things that happen on the other side of a door of power happen. So if you wanted it to end, you could seek to both eliminate this door of power that has destroyed the cocoon and in the event that any more metamorphosis still needs to happen, somehow also need to Snap this waitress out of this trance. At least one of those things, at least still destroying the cocoon, ensures that nothing can still come in or out of it. But everyone else in this diner will still suffer, which is part of the problem that you're here to solve. For the most part. Um, I mean, it's a problem that you're supposed to solve because you have compassion. Aya doesn't care, but he should. Um, you... Being the person touching the cocoon, are aware that the are aware of the fact that all of these things are true. Sierra, all of these, th all, everything that you witness is weird. You just saw Hamaliel touch the cocoon. Go, this is weird. I should get into the cocoon. Have this brief moment of absolute ferality. Open the cocoon and then return to normal. Tempo and John, the only thing that occurs to you briefly in this moment is that you don't know how, but you know that Hamaliel might just destroy this door of power. And you don't know how you feel about that yet. Meanwhile, Hamaliel's just holding like the sides of the cocoon that um, they yeah, them. just holding two edges. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, what is they... essentially like like you know you know how hoagies are cut <laughs> you're holding the cocoon like you're holding two edges of a hot dog roll <laughs> so Havalio looks over and says in a rapturous voice even a day of judgment is the word I will use um, goes I know the ending and basically tells the group that the cocoon wants them to go inside it 
this is very important. There are bad things on the other side of the door. And that if we want to help the people and get rid of the cocoon, unlike our terrible boss, sorry, Tempo, parentheses, um, then we will have to figure out to free how to free the waitress from the cocoon as well. She is sleeping. Right, yeah, that's another thing that you notice. In the cocoon, the waitress's eyes are closed and she's actually, like, breathing normally. It, it does genuinely seem like she is asleep. Her jaw also seems sharper, but nothing else seems to have changed very obviously yet. I believe we must face the terrible, beautiful truth beyond so that we may spare these people. So uh, we, like, eat her out of the thing and go through? Oh, I think the cocoon has room for everybody. It told me to go in, even though she is already there. I mean, would, wouldn't we want to eat her out of it anyways? If possible. Okay, I will do that. I take the waitress out of the cocoon. I have colossal strength. I can do this. <laughs> Have I taught you what it, have I taught Homaliel what a yeet is? I want to be sure. Do you mean you take her out or do you mean you shake the cocoon? I would like I would like Audrey to repeat exactly what Tiara said. It was she was essentially asking if we just, like, yeet her out of the cocoon, is she considered safe? Okay, cool. Um, Mr. God, i.e. Mr. GM, does Hamaliel know what a yeet is? <laughs> I, if I can propose... Yes! You have seen the original meme. I in, this con in this context, I have no idea how you translate that further. You have to tell me what you got from immediately witnessing the meme. Okay. Um, because Tiara said ye, and because Hamaliel said, I'm going to take her out of the cocoon. Um, Hamaliel looks back at the cocoon, holding it like a giant hot dog bun thing, and says, this bitch will be empty, and pulls the waitress out of the cocoon, and then throws her at Tempo. Yee! Aha! So this is why I wanted to clarify, because physically, that is not what occurs. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> you reach into the cocoon to grab the woman and fall inside. That is when you discover that inside the cocoon is several meters larger than an actual cocoon would be. You are not, like, engulfed in cloth. You are stepping into a, like, lilac, lavender-ish, insided other plane of existence within which this woman is actually standing upright, but is still perfectly asleep. It looks like she's leaning on something to decide that is invisible to you. Um, and is surrounded by open space that is surrounded by a wall that seems to be getting further from you the more you step forward towards it. Uh, can I power through darkness to not completely fall into the cocoon? Uh, you can. Okay. <laughs> because I'm guessing that it's not just a matter of physics. Like, I'm actually being nyormed into another dimension. I would like to... It is a lot a matter of physics, but it's a physics that you're not... In fact, no, you're not gonna power through darkness. Um, you're gonna... You're, you're gonna unleash the dark again. That's okay. the role that I want you to do. Okay. I think the opposite of yeet is yoink. So you yeah. yeet the waitress and then get yoinked into the... <laughs> Equal and opposite reactions. Here mm -hmm. we go. Um... 
I am very surprised by this, so I am not going to spend darkness tokens and just hope that Bond can make up for the difference, so... Uh, rolling! It's a perfect hit anyway, it doesn't matter! Okay, cool. Um, so, again, um... This is not avoiding harm or cost, this is... essentially gaining the upper hand. Um... Mm -hmm. You move towards the cocoon and suddenly start grasping the weird physics of the space immediately and stop short before you step in. Your foot steps in and when you look down at your left foot, it looks like it is surrounded by a great deal of, of space around it, which is making you feel like severe vertigo because if you look directly down between both of your feet, it looks like they're in two completely different planes as a result. Um, but you are not, like, totally engulfed in space. And to everybody else, it just looks like you have a foot in the cocoon pressed up against the waitress, even though you're not touching the waitress at all. I warned the party that space is weird. And that tempo, your flying abilities are going to be very important very soon. Um, let's see. Do I know if I go in, I will be able to come out? Like, is it a straight fall down? Or it's just like... No, I'm no, 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 no. There's still... There is ground. You will still be walk. You will still be moving in that space. Um, and... You know that if you walk in, the hole will still be the way that you can come out. But within that space, you can still navigate more action. Um, Ciara, you see all of this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your immediate response to everything that has just taken place? Uh, seeing all of this... It is, it is, just, uh, Sierra is a blunt instrument asking to be able, at, with people asking her to do a delicate job. Uh, so it, it is, it is kind of the idea of, uh, okay, we need to go in there. He is in here. I mean, not here. There's another version of her inside that's standing up, but also sleeping. I don't see anything else in there. I stick my head in. No, I don't. I think she is already confronting what is beyond. Then oh. let's help her, says Hamaliel, and goes all the way in into the <laughs> Yeah, I think it's going to be a follow, I guess. Well, shit, I'm not staying here alone. <laughs> on the on the outside, it looks absolutely strange to you all. The waitress is still inside the cocoon. Very briefly, it looks like Hamaliel is lying up against the waitress. And then, immediately after that, Hamaliel disappears. Yeah, I'll follow Hamaliel in. Yeah, you witness this large cavernous space as well. I think everybody also follows. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think there's. I, I, Hamaliel goes in first, and then Sierra is like, I mean, may as well. And Tempo is like, I'm the leader, have to go. And then John is sitting there looking around like, what? Okay, fi fine. I, and then follows with a, a confused uh, reluctance. But I do believe we all end up inside, right? <laughs> yeah. As you are now all inside, you hear a voice from within this space. Again, looking in all directions, other than what looks like torn cloth behind you that is leading back into the light outside from the diner. It looks like you're just standing in large pink space. And the voice 
says to each of you well the first the voice speaks to each of you in a voice that you all know tempo the voice speaks to you in the voice of the Relayam who was first responsible for bringing the temporal cannon into uh, into the noise war. Ciara, I would like you to qualify this for me. Mm-hmm. Who is who is the first person that ever? judged you cruelly for your power um i think it was it was honestly probably a a different division agent because yet again it's i don't all i do is destroy a lot of times that's not division's mission Is it a division agent or is it someone before, is it someone who witnessed you before you became a member of division? Someone who witnessed you when you were still vulnerable, but still powerful? Yeah, I think so. This voice comes to you as the voice of the very last social worker that you spoke to before you joined the vision. John, it takes a while for you to know this voice, but you at some point place it as the voice of the very first face that you saw in the mirror uh, that you had taken from someone else. Who was that person and how did you come across them, their face? Uh, so that's really, really strange because the first person who saw me uh, was Sierra. The, uh, the origin story is uh, they... The, the last, the very first thing John remembers is being discovered in this government lab by Sierra, who was busy burning the whole damn thing down, and then realized that John was a prisoner as opposed to a participant, and then rescued her. This is grand. Um, yeah, so this voice comes to you as Sierra's voice. Hamaliel. Hi, I'm nervous now. This voice comes to you as a voice that you have heard that you have witnessed in a prophecy before. Uh oh. Whose voice is that? It's the voice of the person who killed me the first time, and it's the voice of the person who is going to kill me for the second and last time. Okay. This is particularly traumatizing, even for uh, John, because while for everybody else they will perfectly understand this tone of voice, for for Jane it will be immediately jarring, because the tone of voice is rude and disconcerting. But it asks in those voices, to each of you individually, what do you want? Is it a voice in our heads or a voice that we perceive as coming from outside us? You all perceive it as coming outside of you, as if it is booming in the room. I want to start with Jin, because the person whose voice you heard is in the room with you. How do you respond to Sierra speaking to you like this? I, yeah, I, 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 the, the problem is that it's, it's going to be kind of like, I know the moment is set up, but that means that like, Essentially, Jane hears CR be like, what do you want? And it's like, excuse me, I didn't, what the shit, is now the time? Like, so you are all, like, head down moment, and John 
then is just like, whoa, okay. Uh, I w To solve the, the mystery? Like thinking that she is speaking to Ciara. Nobody hears Jane say that. The voice responds to you now in your own voice. You are here. You are witnessing the end of the road. Shouldn't that be enough? It, like in my voice? Yeah, this is now in your voice. Instantly changing the facial expression that you cannot see under Jane's mask. The end of and like eyes searching around this this room there's no like way to go forward you said right it's it's a, it's a, a nope. large but enclosed it's, space if you continue walking in any direction you will find more space but it looks walled off around you at about 30 or 35 meters wherever you stand you will only witness it moving further as you continue moving then, uh, then I know how Jane uh, deals with most uh, eldritch abominations and, and uh, transdimensional uh, deities. There's a, a glove-handed shrug, and she says, I thought there'd be more. There can be. And in front of you, you see this weirdly shimmering figure as if it were a ghost but as you as it starts settling in front of you can make out more clearly what it is it is you it is the silhouette of someone that you know in your mind or in your heart is or can be fully you uh, the you is, that you can be this is interesting it touches upon a different part of the sheet which is it's possible that the character playing this playbook is actually the dream of someone else in of someone dreaming off like a, like Azathoth dreams earth into existence kind of thing. And so that's what I'm imagining now is that if John is a projection, then the person who is dreaming is the person that she sees, but you understand immediately like that there's a connection there. So this is the first time that Jane gets to see his own face. And like, oh fuck, that's what I look like. Uh And that 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 takes the wind out of of John's smarmy sails a moment. As you are still reacting to that, Hamaliel, mm -hmm. what do you want? So I'm hearing the voice of my murder say very rudely to me, "What do I want?" Um, can I still see Tempo? You turn to find Tempo and you cannot? I am relieved. And I say, I want to meet you. The figure of the person who killed you emerges toward you. They are... Dressed in clothing that you haven't seen since you were formed on Earth. The regal, angelic dress that no one else can fathom. Because if they fathomed it, it would unravel their minds. Um, the otherworldly equivalent of... Um, like going to a ball in the most expensive, most extravagant dress that one can wear. But as they emerge towards you, they are holding 
the weapon that was used to kill you the first time. So, as we are seeing this from um, Hamaliel's point of view, the audience sees that their murderer looks an awful lot like Tempo. And that the sword they're using has a definite silhouette in common with the psionic sword that Tempo pulled out of time. And Hamaliel smiles at their murderer sunnily, as they always smile, and say, That's how I remember you looking. As you are settling in this moment, Sierra, what do you want? And it's, it's a question that she has thought about before. And there's kind of a, a moment where movements stutter and she just looks around kind of trying to figure out where the voice is coming from and just goes to be loved by whom someone who accepts me as i am You say that like that person exists, Ciara. Well, we're phrasing it like a wish. It can be one. And emerging from your right side, you see... A figure that you've never seen before, slender, soft, just about your height, um, masculine, but not uh, no one that you recognize, but moves with a mannerism that you recognize immediately as Jane. And Jane walks up to you takes your hands in theirs and says, is this what you want? And they're looking at you with pure compassion, a kind of depth that you immediately recognize as warmth and immediately notice that you have rarely, if ever had, in a moment of solace in your entire life. Are my hands still on fire? Your hands are no longer on fire, but the minute that you recognize that, you're feeling warmth from behind you. Kind of look towards the warmth, the like ever present warmth. You know, it always feels like she's feverish or you know, the kind of like you touch someone and you're like, you're burning up, literally. You turn, but John says, no, you don't have to look there. You just look at me. I, I, I mean, it's the, the, the curiosity of understanding where this comes from the 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 power and it's sierra's never really like she and jane are close but it's 
it it is of the um you know it's it's never it's like that thought never crossed my mind uh, and it's just it's like something instinctually just doesn't feel right it's John doesn't touch me. John has never touched anyone. You uh, think all of that. You think all of that aloud, uh -huh. and well, you think all of that silently, rather, uh -huh. and responding as if he is hearing you. Think these things. Jane leans in a little further and goes, "But wouldn't you like that?" Wouldn't you like this to keep happening? Don't we both deserve this? It and... never crossed your mind before, but it's crossing your mind now. Do you like that thought? The warmth behind you gets more intense. More intense. And it, it is a, of a feeling of this warmth, this presence that I, I felt like forever. And knowing that it's just like, this, it doesn't feel right. What about, where's everyone else? None of, nothing else matters. You can have this. You can be happy. You know that. You know you deserve that. And now you hear Sarah, crackling behind you. And now Sierra is thinking about anyone that has gotten close. She is also in a way of touching people. They physically touching people leave scars behind when your skin is superheated and you touch someone no matter what it's it's gonna burn. And now is thinking, it's like, why isn't it burning? Like, why isn't, why am I not smelling burning skin? And you are. It, I am? You are. Mm -hmm. As you now, as you think of it, it occurs to you. Jane's fine, but you are smelling something burning. Looking down at my hands, is it, is it where we're, where we're touching? Your hands are not on fire. The heat behind you grows more intense. And there is a... There is a presence. And... There's a move. That I think... Seems like it might fit here. Is it my dark patron? Yes. Would you like to read my dark patron? Yes, my dark patron. It was one of the surge ruin moves. Is a harbinger claims they will help you, assuring you that they are working against the other harbingers for their own agenda. Uh, it's when you call on your patron, tell them what you need. Keeper will describe what you must do in return. Uh, I can either mark one ruin to agree to their terms and describe how your dark patron becomes stronger, or mark two ruin to display your power to a horrifying effect instilling fear and respect for, uh, in them. They will give you need what you need without advancing their agenda, but you suspect this was their plans all along. Mm-hmm. Uh, so choose. I think it's the... the two ruin. Okay. And Sierra burns with the power of the sun. You never looked behind you, yes? I never did. You... You look John in the eyes mere moments before they are about to tell you you don't have to fight this you can just be happy for once do you reply before you do anything 
Uh, Before this say, actually happens, do you say anything? I say, I don't think that's in the cards for me. Sudden starburst occupies the entire space in uh, red and then white light. The camera pans behind you just before that light engulfs the rest of the space to show that what would have what would have been available for you to see if you had turned around is the charred bodies of every person that you have ever met. But because you didn't turn around, the flames fade from their bodies. And they all wake up as if they had just been stirred from a very restful sleep just before the wave of white light envelops their portion of the space. Tempo. What do you want? I want to convince Janice that she is drowning herself and the world, trying to fill a hole with envy that can only be filled with love. This general, previously not physically visible, emerges from behind you. You can hear his footsteps toward you. And is holding the temporal cannon, holding like a like Gatling gun-sized version of the temporal cannon to your back and says, Why did you always have to be so noble? When the world is always so destructive, you can be a source of peace in this world. Instead, you are always so patient for the things that do not care for you. My heart dance calls me to see, to know, to remember, to flow and dance, to leap and linger. What does your heart dance lead you to? It seems only oblivion. Oblivion is fine by me. And then suddenly, a beam of light shoots through the general's torso, not wounding him. It seems like it passes right through him, like if he were a sheet of glass. And then his visage fades away. You no longer feel the cannon against your back. You can see the light, like, pass diagonally past you. And then a lot of warmth and a lot of light fills up this space. John, your space is suddenly, before you can respond even to the notion of knowing yourself, light fills up this space. Uh, ha uh, Hamaliel, there is this brief moment as Temple walks toward you, almost seductively, um, places a hand at the small of your back and places the psionic blade uh, at your neck and says maybe not today but whenever you want just before warmth and light fills your space as well you all come to in the same like lilac tiled pink walled space as before but now you can all see each other and you can all see Janice wake up in uh, a panicked stir as if she just woke up from a weird, not immediately frightening, but still very disturbing nightmare. React to the four of you in shock and run through uh, the uh, hole in the cocoon. That's when Ciara, you notice... The edges of the cocoon are on fire. You are muted, my friend. I am. I just got the pop-up saying I'm muted. And it's definitely like, seeing that things are on fire. This thing is probably going to burn very quickly. Might want to get out of here. Uh, and seeing that, uh, you know, seeing that and seeing my friends just being... We should run. 
we came down here because she's the key. If she's whatever's on the other side, whatever's at the end of this tunnel, it she's what it's into. And John is oh, going to take off after uh, the waitress. Because his understanding is that like she's in the cocoon, she's the perfect thing, can't let the evil thing have the perfect thing. Bish bosh. Because she ran... Uh, did she run out yeah, deeper? Yeah, she ran out. Or no, she ran. Back. She ran out the hole. She ran out the hole that Tamal yell made. She is leaving the cocoon. Oh well, yeah, yeah. She's safe then. Things are in fire. They'll burn. Uh, in that case, rewinding. Yeah, good. She's out, but there is still time to punch God. Like we can slam the door shut. It will open another one. This problem isn't solved yet. <sighs> you say that. And then, all of a sudden, in this room, you see Hamaliel, Ciara, and Tempo turn towards you rigidly and ask, Is that really what you want? Oh, at this point, uh, there's like the frustration boiling up in front of, of, of Jane, uh, having had the conversation with Tempo on the back of multiple different breakdowns, on the back of having melted canonically two faces out of existence for uh, their own menagerie. At this point, Jane's kind of getting upset. <laughs> and, uh, I, yeah, because you know what? I'm tired of being fucked with. I am tired of my friends being fucked with. I am tired of these big damn scary things coming into my world my head their head and and and, and ruining shit i'm tired of feeling this way because of what you are you turn to ciara and instead of ciara even though ciara is still standing there you see um, Janice wearing half of your Volto mask going what I am what you are causes more messes than I could ever cause uh, and Hamaliel turns to you and is uh, Whitney wearing half a Volto mask and goes you could just settle on a person anytime you want, but you just keep causing more problems for yourself. That has nothing to do with me. The line is, I have settled on a person, and it's my self. Cueing back to the tempo speech, and then I would like to unleash the dark. <laughs> Hell yeah. yes. Okay. I don't have darkness tokens, but I need to come back and see have I gained them at some point. Sure. Uh, no. I, in fact, yeah, I will say everybody in their previous scenes gains two darkness tokens except for Ciara, who gains four. I did ask someone to open their little ask finger quotes. <laughs> Put an asterisk on ask. Because uh, I will... Turn around and uh, and spend put those. me at five. Oh God! I so I want you to know that the only role that I've passed the entire time we've been playing is the um, the uh, the second the second uh, uh, that doomsday open the door role. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe uh, in you. Also, if things go poorly, that's that's the name of the game, and there's still drama in that. Uh, yeah, I can. Spend, I have one. I have a bond with Sierra left that I can spend to get to eight because I'm at seven. I do not like the idea of you have greatly underestimated them, and the keeper will describe the desperate position you find yourself in. Uh, so I am going to uh, spend a bond with Sierra to make it an eight. Okay. Uh, you will the darkness with control and the ease. Choose two. Uh, yeah. First of all, um, I 
I think that this, like the rejection and me making that choice w might confuse them because it seems that they were trying to like act logically with me or or, or do like a, a persuasive devil's bargain. And they were not expecting Jane of all people to just be like, I'm my own person, uh, especially given their background with the idea that if I confusing them, if it buys time to either like lock out uh, to, to make them release their grip on the other three or, or buy some time for that. Um, and then the second, I would like to expose a weakness or flaw. Okay, so that's... What was the first one? Um, so the, the pitch is to use Confuse Them for a time to get them to relinquish whatever they're doing to Tempo, to Ciara, and to Hamaliel. Um, or I suppose I could use Inflict a Condition, uh, but I want to break them out of the spell if possible. And then the second one is to expose a weakness or flaw, essentially, how do I hurt this thing? Ah, okay. So I'll give you I'll give you this for free. Exposing a weakness or flaw while also doing that will also immediately reveal to you that the three figures you have spoken to was not the real Hamaliel, the real Tempo, the real Ciara. You are still speaking at them. This is where I cut to everybody and point out that all of you just heard Jane be really mad at you for things that you have not said. <laughs> Confusion. Okay. Um, so then... But that also means that you also learn... Again, one. If the cocoon is destroyed, no one can come in or out of this door. But also, the Harbinger is here. Yeah, I'm, I'm you get take... the you get the impression that it's less that the harbinger is in the cocoon, and more that some element of the harbinger has made the cocoon, and that if you simply destroy it, it will just return to the rest of the sculpture as a solid object, which can still be stored, or you can try to, you can attempt to destroy it separately. But you do not have the materials to store it at this moment, so you will need to power through darkness to essentially hold it in your own physical grasp until you get back to the post office, which will require a great deal of effort. Okay, I can roll with that. So, uh, the, the lashing out part, uh, if that's what creates this revelation, because because Jane is down here to to punch this thing until it bleeds or or whatever's, and if lashing out breaks this illusion and creates that, then yes, the idea is we can destroy the cocoon, we can make it return to the statue, and then I don't know, make the statue fucking uh, Ira's problem, right? Like that, whatever, we'll figure it out. Division has to have a thing for this kind of thing, but. Now that I know how the how the thing works, then I'm going to do that. And I will actually, like, yell uh, to Sierra, not 100% trusting that um, it is Sierra, but, like, I haven't seen another Sierra, so we're going to run with it. Uh, and yeah, just... you know that it's, you know that the Sierra you've spoken to is fake, but you are not seeing Sierra at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh... Oh, wait, wait, you said that I know the one I'm talking to is fake, but I can't see the real one? Yeah. So you oh. can still speak. You can still speak to Ciara, just you won't hear Ciara respond to you. Okay, uh, and you that know case, that in that yeah. sense. Uh, then I will. Uh, John. John doesn't scream. John just talks more intently and enunciates more clear. Enunciates more clearly. Uh, and I will say. Uh, there's nothing left for us down here except the promise of Ash. And then, like, a wink, but with her voice. Ciara, after the brief confusion of Jane being very mad at you, you hear that. In your voice, mind you. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it's just a... Okay, we're gonna burn things more. Sure. 
Don't know what that earlier thing was about, but we'll deal with it later. No, we won't. <laughs> John, this will talk. never come up again. <laughs> not going to talk about again. her feelings. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so would you like to make a move, Ciara? Yeah. The... Uh, I did this before, but it's the, the move, I am your destruction. Okay. What does it do? Uh, uh, you hold on to your power with an intensity that would break most souls. You're always a single breath away from shattering under pressure. When you allow your power to surge and cause gr uh, great collateral damage, ask the keeper what catastrophic destruction you cause. And choose two. You. Here's the thing about Ciara Tan. Part of the reason why you are severely distrusted by most mortals and why the vision doesn't treat you any nicer in comparison is because. You are slowly becoming aware of the fact that your um, capacity for pyrokinesis is actually increasing exponentially in a way that is difficult for you to physically track. It's not pyrokinesis. You're actually accessing large stores of, like resting cosmically located um like gas giant cores you are just essentially a conduit for not necessarily flame so much as the expanded capacity for overwhelming combustion it's like how in x-men um, they retconned that uh, Cyclops' eyes don't produce laser beams, but they produce concussive force that is coming from portals in his eyes that lead from a dimension that just creates concussive force. Your body is a portal to a dimension that is just a sun. You can release all of that energy right now, and it will supernova this entire cocoon. You have no idea what will happen beyond the cocoon, because there is a, a, literally a vent behind you where this will go out into the diner, and you have no idea how much further. You could potentially raise this block, but this cocoon will be, this cocoon will be done for. Yeah, I mean, it, it is definitely a moment of turning to everyone else and it's just like when i said run before this time i mean it As, all of you, you know, know ciara means it all of you know in your heart of hearts ciara means it yeah the only person who would possibly withstand this is hamaliel hamaliel's gonna be busy she needs to carry jane <laughs> I just sort of like move forward to sort of a central location and it is that the, the, you know, the, the starts off with the, the flames wreathing the hands and going up the arms. I, if I'm wearing a shirt or anything, it's probably going to be burned away at this point. Uh, as I will just sort of hold it in, but build it at the same time for just hopefully one quick concentrated blast which is not going to be either one of those uh but i'm hoping it's that uh and, and to sort of look in a way and make sure that everyone else is out of this cocoon oh and i'm not I leaving you i can't see them anymore before i unleash it i thought you were carrying jane but i threw jane out i'm oh. strong enough i can do that <laughs> yeeted yeah yeeted. yeeted then yeah i'm Gonna, gonna do that know, knowing Hamaliel, and it's probably a point of like not even a conscious decision. It is, I can't hold this anymore. Uh, and just burning, burning away anything I'm wearing. Uh, you know, skin is 
it should honestly have third degree burns over most of my body, if not beyond. I should not exist after this. But somehow I do, and it is the fire that is so hot, you know, that it's, you're, you're almost just like, that shouldn't be that color, but it is because it's just that hot. And um, I think these make sense for what I'm doing. The two I would like to choose are, I would permanently gain an aspect of the Harbinger's powers of darkness. And I'm gonna reshape. No, I'm gonna protect the person who matters most. And I guess in the moment, in the moment, I will protect Amalia. Okay. Hamaliel, what do you do as you are here? Um, I'm imagining it like it's some kind of grand finale to the to an anime. It's the building up to this moment. The protagonist has done like the final power up of the final episode of the final season. So in that wind up, Hamaliel yells into um like the maelstrom of flame that Ciara has become do everything you can I will be fine and yeah I just trust in the fact that I don't die today <laughs> and I gain darkness tokens because if I ask someone to give me their best shot and not hold back I gain darkness tokens <laughs> Hell yeah. I also nice. gain darkest tokens because I will give into my power and I'll let it erase my will. Mm -hmm. So that this puts is what me at six, by the way, I That'll guess. That'll put me at like seven. Mm -hmm. How many do you think uh, that should give me? Two, three, or four? Yeah, that, I would say that's two for you. Yeah, okay. two for you both. Two for you both, yes. So, <laughs> here's what happens on camera in sequence. Um, Amaliel yeets John out of the uh, uh, cocoon. So we see on camera outside the outside of the cocoon, Jane's body fly out at uh, fly into the cocoon and out into a dino. <laughs> Into a dino window and then outside into the co the parking lot outside. Scraped but not severely injured. Um, Tempo flies out of the cocoon immediately behind you, and then we cut back into uh, the cocoon. Uh, Ciara and Hamalia looking at each other as heat rises around Ciara's body and starts, and you can feel. Uh, it intensify and start building from within you. And it sounds on camera less like a bang and more like a pop. And then from outside the diner window, we see this gust of wind emerge from the uh, inside of the cocoon very suddenly from as, as if from nowhere. And then this large concussive blast breaks all of the windows that are not already broken in the diner. The cocoon immediately turns to ash. Like, you don't even see it uh, burst or combust. It just immediately catches flame and disappears, and everything else is now engulfed in wind and flame. The entire diner is on fire. None of the other civilians here are, though. They get pushed to uh, as far back from the uh, diner counter as possible, stir awake, witness the fire, and flee. And now, behind the diner counter, you can just see Ciara and Hamaliel pressed up very close against each other against the diner, against the diner counter. Hi. Huh. 
fuck. Are you okay? Um. No. You as you say that, okay. <laughs> as you say that, Temple, as you flow outside, uh, all the way out uh, of the diner, after the blast takes place, um, you hear something squealing from somewhere around the parking lot. It's like high-pitched inhuman squeal. When you look for it, it looks like a piece of asphalt is moving towards the grass beyond the parking lot. So I reach out to that chunk of asphalt and I'm going to use for the first time this additional power of darkness that I've gained, which is void spells. Mm -hmm. I reach out, I draw a circle, I kind of turn turn my big too many jointed hand and i do this kind of drawing drawing past or like i'm pulling taffy and that chunk of asphalt and whatever being is with it is attenuated so infinitesimally that it may as well not exist i would like you to unleash the dark for me Sure thing. Wait, no, not unleash the dark. Do I want to power, power the through darkness? darkness limits of your supernatural yes. powers. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 I am going to spend three darkness tokens and roll. That is nine. Hey, On hey. an eight to nine, you use your powers with great precision and effect, changing the situation before you. Additionally, the keeper may offer you reprieve, a golden opportunity, or a bond. Hey! 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 hey. A wonderful thing happens. You do that, you notice the asphalt respond to you by stop being by no longer being asphalt and returning to its previous pewter form. Um, as you begin to interact with it, it tries to make like this large pewter spike behaving in its ferromagnetic form as previous in an attempt to stab you in the forehead, but you react quickly enough that it stops just before your hand as your spell starts manifesting and you can see it like slowly start uh fading away into like small torn off pieces of what looks like it is being reduced to ash like the cocoon was falling apart very slowly and just kind of drifting up into the air Ciara, as that happens you feel something within you get very warm and then get very cool again i would like you to just roll 2d6 for me okay. seven aha uh -huh. you are briefly stricken with the idea that there is a thing that you can do now. In the way that you would typically manifest your flame, you try to draw that energy out of you. And very briefly, you notice that there is an outline just beyond where you and Hamaliel are standing. And that outline looks like a smoke silhouette of you. Very briefly, you think you made that. That if you focus very deeply, you can not merely make flame, but make things out of flame. And even have those things function in the world as the things they are, but also flame. But you are so confused and tired and exhausted, and Hamaliel is very close, and you feel very sweaty. And this diner is on fire. Mm -hmm. I pick Ciara up and I say, this is why I say, someone needs to carry you home. 
And then I start walking out of the diner with Ciara in my arms. You walk towards the door, and the door opens towards you. The door, which is on fire, opens towards you. And Ayer steps out of it and goes, What did I tell you? I didn't even have to make this door now. All you had to do was... You know what? Get inside. Thank you. Yep. Doesn't <laughs> say anything. <laughs> sort of like, am I giving him peace shine or am I flipping him off? Who knows? <laughs> we cut to two days afterward. You've all been briefed by Division. At least two of you have had Division-mandated therapy sessions that are less therapy sessions and more just being more harshly judged by Division. Um, and then you all go back to the places where you stay. The fax machine in the post office prints another document in the middle of the night afterward that drifts back up to the table that says very uh, clearly RVX 2307 neutralized um, post office representatives debriefed mission cleared and like some very very fine print like 0 0.0125 millimeter text on this sheet of paper that is the insurance write-up for all of the damages that have been caused a stamp falls through a trap door in the ceiling of the post office even though there is nothing above the post office stamps the sheet of paper rolls off the desk and then the sheet of paper catches fire. Tempo, where are you when you get this text? You are about to get a text. Where are you when you get this text? So, if it's okay, are the camera lingers on the insurance claim, and the numbers start getting fuzzy. Because when we cut to Tempo, they are rolling back time for the diner until it was not on fire and the insurance claim number changes because they don't have to pay for all of the diner and then they get the text Dear Temple, thank you for your service. You have done great work for Division this season, and we would like to commend you for all of the hard work that you have done uh, for this year. And, like, a bunch of uh, r random formalities about gifts and bonuses that you do not care about, because you actually just care about the work, and also don't have need for, like, a Maserati, because you can fly. Hamaliel, where are you when you get this text? I'm getting ice cream. Jane talked about it. I'm really interested. Jane explained to me that ice cream is made out of mammary secretions. It sounded disgusting, but I'm going to try it because I want to connect to my friends. Are you there by yourself? I have friends, right? Someone's with me to get ice cream. <laughs> You invite, like, someone who lives nearby to you to just get ice cream, and they're like, uh, yeah, sure. Um, you go to this ice cream place, like, the best ice cream place in town has, like, all kind of weird flavors that you've never really thought about. Like, they have, um... And every berry flavor that, like, every single berry that can ever possibly be made um, in just, like, one, like, pile. You get the text. The text says, thank you for your service. You can go back home now. That's all it says. What flavor of ice cream do you get? I ask 
the ice cream representative to give me the loneliest flavor because Jane was the one who told me about ice cream and Jane is a lonely person. So I want to get this ice cream as a tribute to Jane. Nice. Uh, the uh, guy behind the counter is like, is like, what do you... I guess no one really likes rum and raisin because we make the we make it kind of strong um if you're into that i guess um gives you two scoops of rum and raisin in a styrofoam cup i would like you to power through darkness wow wow rude (laughs) power through rum and raisin cool um spend darkness tokens and roll well, I have six darkness tokens, so I need to spend these things to not mm-hmm. be torn between. Although, hilariously, I could just spend one and then be torn between because I had such awful ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. Well, how do other people feel? <laughs> I think you should roll the two. I think you should add the I'll two. I'll roll the two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two. I miss. <laughs> oh, this is Jane's fault, so I'm spending a bond with Jane. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, actually, just in case I roll a one, because Jane's rolls have been cursed, I'm going to add two. So I like ice cream so bad it damages friendships. Yeah. Ow. Okay, now it's a hit. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you, you, you can offer me a reprieve, a golden opportunity, or a bond, and I change the situation before me. <laughs> Thanks, mm-hmm. rum and raisin. So, you are ravenously eating this ice cream. A mortal would suffer brain freeze at this moment. You've also never really had alcohol before, because no one has ever invited you to drink before, because you mm. look like a child. But you are experiencing this ice cream in this moment, and you don't know why. You don't know what about it, what about its texture or its taste actually gives you this feeling. But as you're eating it, you suddenly recall one of the first times that you met Jane. At the division offices, both of you feeling... You don't know what it's feel like, what it feels like to feel like an outcast, but you did feel it. And you did feel that John felt that way as well. And you did know that you were bonding over that feeling. And this ice cream feels like bonding, even though Jane's not here. And you, it immediately strikes you with the idea that you should probably buy some rum and raisin for Jane as well. I do meanwhile, your company. <laughs> meanwhile, your company sees you get these two scoops of rum and raisin ice cream, take a plastic spoon, pick up an entire scoop and put that entire scoop into your mouth and goes, that's not normal, is it? And we cut. (laughs) Uh, Sierra, where are you when you get this text? I am... Just this visual of Sierra sitting on the top of a very tall building doing the thing, you know, where you're like leaning over the rail, uh, you know, you know, feet dangling and just kind of looking out over the city and just sort of being alone with her thoughts. Power through darkness for me. Well, there is a power through darkness. Sure, let's spend three, which will, uh, yeah. We're gonna. Is it gonna roll? 
do the thing. Uh, oh, there it is. Aha. A yes. perfect hit. Yes. The last few days you have no longer felt feverish. You've just felt warm. It's noticeable now because it's like 14 degrees. But you don't feel cold. You don't feel like you're fighting the cold. You just don't feel cold. You feel like you're at resting body temperature all the time now since leaving the diner. You wave your hand in front of you again. What is the thing that you are thinking of making in this moment? Um, making little clouds of smoke shaped like various different animals. You settle on that notion and you make what are actually small miniature fire figures in the air a very small tiger a very small rabbit a very small dog a very small giraffe a very small eagle that are briefly fully flame before you decide it's smoke that i wanted and the heat starts fading away from them and they're just like very gray clouds that are moving in the air in front of you as if they were real You get the text from Division. Thank you very much for your assistance. You may go home now. Just sort of look at it and just being like, yeah. <laughs> but it's just like, it's home? What is home? You say that the tiger turns to you and tilts its head and mews as if it were just a house cat. Jane, where are you when you get this text? Uh, Jane is in uh, a basement office, probably uh, at Division. I imagine that uh, they were one of the people selected for therapy because I think they're probably the one who needs the therapy. <laughs> uh, and we're not in a mood to go home, but uh, they are thumbing through their their little book of faces, uh, and it's it's a spiral ringed notebook, and they have gone through and uh, found Sierra's from the very very beginning, and then Hamaliel's somewhere in the middle, and then there is the last page, which is the montage of Tempo, uh, and she is tearing those pieces out because she trusts herself to be able to remember their faces after what they've been through now. <clears throat> you received the text message. Thank you very much for your assistance. You may go home now. How many darkness tokens do you have at the moment? Uh, I am to zero. Uh... I cleared them all off by uh, suffering from the being torn between, and then I spent the two that I had on, on the last roll of mine. Mm -hmm. Nice. You are looking through the book when you realize there is a drawing in this book that you never remember having made. It is... A young person, 13, 14 maybe, you don't meet a lot of teenagers in this line of work for very obvious reasons, and the ones that you have met are either other omen class harbingers who work for Division or have been sought by Division, children who were briefly in the line of fire who you ensured uh, maintained safety, which is why you're absolutely sure you don't recognize this one, or 
random people that you have met on the side of this on the side of the road or like while passing through spaces which because of your propensity to refuse large crowded spaces because of the overall that this has has on your uh, powers is incredibly limited because it kind of limits your your travel to um, night or very um, like low thoroughfare locations where children are very unlikely to come across randomly. But you have no idea who this kid is. Uh, where do the chronologically where do they appear in the book? Very early. It's page three. Okay. It's not impossible that I've forgotten. But I don't think I would forget this one. You usually take notes next to all of these uh, drawings. This drawing has no notes. And it's in my, my style. I hesitate to say it, Jane yeah. has an artistic style, but... <laughs> it is. If it is, it is arguably even more vividly in your style than any other sketch that you've ever made. This is confusing, and Jane finds things that are confusing to be scary, because normally the explanations, like, look at my line of work. Uh, I'm going to tear this page out, too. Okay. I uh, would think that that division has like uh, like theta class recycle destroyer kind of like maximum version shredder burner things and. Oh yeah, things. they have they have powerful incinerators that they use to destroy most other objects. Um, you put it in the incineration location um, garbage chute. And it falls down and lands directly on the glass shards and remainder of the Pitman sculpture that Aya put there after um, the portion of the sculpture that you all destroyed at the diner became inert. We're going to deal with this memory the way we deal with lots of memories and feelings. We're going to put them in the squish down place and we're never going to think them ever again. The therapist said I had to come back next week. I don't know why. So two or three days later, you all receive the same text message as before summoning you back to the post office. But th this time it's roughly in the day. Um, who arrives to the post office first? Not me. Probably Tempo, because Tempo is... The best. And controls time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Tempo showed up last last time, so they should mm -hmm. show up first now. Mm -hmm. And say that uh that John comes next. Uh and on the the journey they've been through as a person, uh it is still a black hoodie, but there are little orange caps on the strings now instead of black caps. Oh growth. Ciara? Next yeah. or last? Yeah, I guess Ciara will show up in like the middle where it's like, I don't want to be late because I'm going to get yelled at, but I don't want to be early either, so I'll settle for arriving right in the middle. Sort of, you know, walks in, sees everyone, nods, goes to sit on the counter. I guess that means I arrive last and I'll stay, but I arrive late because I ran halfway there, realized I forgot the ice cream that I bought for Jane, ran back, grabbed it, ran all the way. You <laughs> ran all the way here. Okay, cool. You arrive, you give Jane the ice cream. Jane, there is a bowl of rum and raisin milk in your hand <laughs> not for long i'm going to annihilate this this is the greatest thing that could ever touch human tongues and i am so thrilled melted or not like i i will drink this like 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 a like hands around a chalice uh my real hands touching the bowl and the other two giving like very choice thumbs up gestures to Hamaliel. 
Well, I did buy a carton, so it's milk inside a carton. <laughs> so it's even better. It's yeah. not even in a bowl. <laughs> It's like one of those like sealed yeah 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 and while jane's like chugging away at this carton i lean over and i whisper to um ciara it's obvious ice cream hmm it, it was ice cream yeah uh half of the the uh the contents now uh down the gullet uh, Jane will lower the box and just like face is of course filthy right there's no dignified way to drink <laughs> melted ice cream out and then offers it around the room like eh 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 unless you want boiled ice cream I already had two scoops tempo <laughs> <laughs> sure. tempo why not Temple, very briefly in this moment, you have a sudden flashback to like a party that you went to when you were very, very young uh, on your home planet, where this in this exact scene feels like deja vu to the first time uh, a person that you had severe attraction to offered you a glass of something to drink like one of the like rare non-alcohol but still very stimulating drinks that occur on your planet um and you responded much the exact same as you enter and then leave that um very faded memory aya emerges in a puff of smoke from the door turns to you all and goes ah you're already here i get to give you all of these and leave um he offers you all um orange envelopes with the division insignia um as a uh stamp on the top left corner of the envelope um each of you get one of those and he goes Congratulations, and then disappears in a puff of smoke again before any of you can respond to him. Hold this between two fingers and like look at it, just being like, "Are we being are we being fired?" I open it. Jane is gonna peer over Hamaliel's shoulders because their real hands are covered in melted ice cream, <laughs> and there's no way they're gonna be able to open the envelope with with gloves. Dear entity slash creature. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> we are I bet pleased. Tempo gets a name on their letter. <laughs> Tempo gets a name. Um, you, we are pleased to inform you that you have now been uh, locationally promoted within division with within uh, division temporal uh, uh, quarters. You are no longer stationed at the post office. Uh, your next physical assignment as to uh, where you will gain further mission briefs and debriefs will be relayed to you via text message. Um, thank you so very much for your uh, continued service towards Division's goals. Uh, we wish you a happy new year. Um, and a lot of signatures that look less like signatures and more like what what signatures would uh, like it looks like signatures kind of collapse into solid shapes near the end in ways that give the vague impression that there are someone's name but when you look at them they don't look like names at all. Um, as you see Hamaliel open their letter, it dawns on you that your envelope tempo is much thicker than the amount of paper that Hamaliel just read would imply. I will open mine as well. Yours is like three, three sheets 
of a typewritten letter about how grateful they are that you put up with this crew and now that you can go back to working from core division headquarters they're very grateful that you were willing to essentially slam it like this and we will and that you will be uh, reimbursed handsomely for all of the efforts that you've made throughout the year so i look at this crumple the paper throw it in a trash bin and then gangly with li fingers that are too big type a text message to ire that says unnecessary i will go with my team we cut to uh aya who is um in <laughs> He's dressed like Guy Fieri <laughs> on a hammock in an unidentified island, sipping from a Long Island iced tea in a highball glass that is 18 inches long. And he, he feels his phone vibrate, reaches for his phone, looks at your text. And the last scene that we see is him laughing so heartily that the flames that erupt from his head burn the edge of his hammock off and he falls to the ground. And we smash cut to black. And that is the end of the Pitma Sculpture. <laughs> Woo! Hey. I had a lot more weirdness planned and then y'all did all of the coolest things that I ever wanted in the last like 50 minutes of this thing. I was like, this is how this is supposed to end. Y'all gave me the ending. I love this so very much. Y'all are brilliant. Thank you so very much for joining me for this. This is rad. How do you all feel about the Pitman Sculptia? It's so much fun. It was a wild ride. I'm very happy with how it turned out for everybody. <laughs> Yeah, you all made such brilliant decisions. I'm, as a GM, I I wish we ha we could have lingered long enough so so some of y'all could have stumbled into ruin. But I'm also very glad that while y'all went through a lot, we didn't get that far because I like the way that the story materialized as a result of y'all struggling with how weird this kind of work is, but not stumbling into complete ruin. So yeah, thank you so very much for joining me for this wild ride. Um, I guess the only thing left to do as a result is to ask each of you lovely people to let all of the lovely people listening know who you are, what you do, and where folks can find you next. Starting with Mike. Thanks so much, everybody. And thank you, Brandon, for uh, being an amazing keeper for this lovely story. I am Mike Underwood, they or he pronouns. I am an author, uh, actual play creator, as you see here, and a game designer. You can find me on various socials at Mike R. Underwood. Mm -hmm. Yoi! Hello, and very soon goodbye. I am Yoi Gawain Lin, he, they pronouns for me, game and fiction writer, and tonight I was Hamaliel, the apocalyptic cinnamon roll. Uh, you can find me on the Blue Sky app at the Magpie Bridge and kind of, sort of, on whatever Twitter used to be at This Is My Design, but I'm not really there anymore, so perhaps not. Very fair. Next, Aaron. Hi. Yes, hello. I am Aaron. Wow, this was great. I had a ton of fun with this character, and thank you all so much for coming along this journey with me. It was It was great. Uh, normally, I'm the one in charge of tormenting players, so if you'd like to see me on the other side of the GM screen inflicting emotional pain instead of suffering from it, you can do so uh, at Queen's Court RPG on Twitter, at Queen's Court Games pretty much everywhere else. Uh, that is where you'll find me running our, our actual play series, uh, including our award-winningest at time of recording actual play uh, podcast, uh, The All Night Society. Uh, featuring Vampire the Masquerade. Aside from that, if you occasionally want to see me just riff on actual play, have big thoughts about TTRPGs, you can do that on Twitter, at Aaron and Words. Uh, likewise on Blue Sky. I'm not anywhere else, because I'm bad at social media. Mm -hmm. And next, Aubrey. Hello, I'm Aubrey. You can find me all over the internet, either at The Mad Queen or Mad Queen Cosplay, just on Twitter, really. 
Uh, I'm Mad Queen everywhere else. So I got lucky enough to snag it. Um, and yeah, uh, if you like seeing me play disaster characters, I play a lot of them. Uh, and, you know, I play quite a few of them over on uh, Queen's Court in various projects. Uh, you know, if not, you'll probably also, if you hear music on a thing, I probably have a hand in it in some way. If not, it actually scoring it. Um, and then you can also catch me over on Goblets and Gaze as the GM for like 90% of things. Uh, and by the time you're hearing or watching this, uh, our very first campaign is over. Uh, three years, it, it, three years of 150 episodes. Uh, and yeah, you can listen to the entirety of Blood of Kings, our, our Greek and Greek Norse inspired Pathfinder campaign. Uh, and probably while uh, while you're listening to this, you can go over and listen to season two of our Alien game, Mother May I, run by one of the players, or I just playing a mom who wants to go home. Uh, and then after that, there's there's lots of fun things. So keep an eye on Goblets and Gays, and uh, then. Also, you can catch me over on uh, Howard Haven Studios uh, in City of Smoke every Friday. Nice. Grand. Uh, and as for me, uh, I am Brandon O'Brien. I have been keeping the keys, so you don't have to. Uh, you can find me almost everywhere on the internet at The Rising Tides. And I have a website that is also my newsletter at brandonobrien.xyz, where you can find me talking about fiction and game design and all kinds of other social things. And I also design games that you can get at itch.io. Um, that's the rising tides.itch.io for any of the random silly things that I've been working on, uh, including um, an upcoming uh, Blades in the Dark hack called Hero Revolution uh, about becoming spandex, hero spandex superheroes and, and saving the world from uh, all kinds of weird but not necessarily evil things. Um, so yeah, this was a lot of fun. A reminder to everyone that you can support cool things like this existing on Speculate by supporting patreon.com slash speculate and hear more of the cool things that we have made on Speculate at speculatesf.com. Um, lots of very interesting things on the horizon, hopefully, that I'm very excited for us to venture out into the future and discover. And you can help us make some of those cool things happen over at Speculate. And uh, obviously also support uh, Queen's Court Games in the cool things that they make as well, because this has been really lovely. And I'd like for us to continue doing uh, collaborations like this in the future, because y'all were rad. And so very inspiring in all of your decisions that I would like for this to continue as often as possible. So thank you again for joining us uh, in play. This was really fun for me to see you all engage in these shenanigans so freely. Uh, thank you all to everyone who is listening or watching for joining us on this weird journey. And uh, all that is left for me to do is to tell you I hope that you have a wonderful night. I hope that you have a wonderful week. And... I hope that whatever is knocking on that door is exactly what you're expecting. Thank you so very much. And we will all see you sometime, somewhere, very soon.